Good morning. The March 23rd, 2022 meeting of Halliburton County Council is now in session. Warden Liz Danielson presiding. Good morning, everyone. Uh, could we have a roll call, please, Mr. Redder? Yes, Warden Danielson. I'm present. Councillor Moffat. Present. Councillor Roberts. Present. Councillor Kennedy. Present. Councillor Burton. Here. Councillor Ryle. Present. Councillor DeVolin. Present. And Councillor Shell. Present. Thank you. We respectfully acknowledge that the County of Halliburton is located on Treaty 20 Mishi Saugeek territory and in the traditional territory of the Mishi Saugeek and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations. We acknowledge a shared presence of Indigenous nations throughout the area and recognize its original Indigenous inhabitants as the stewards of its lands and waters since time immemorial. Could we have, or could I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the agenda? Uh, Councillor DeVolan and Burton. Moved by Councillor DeVolan, seconded by Councillor Burton, be it resolved that the March 23rd, 2022 Halliburton County Council agenda be approved. All in favor? It's carried. Is there any notice of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof today? Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the uh, minutes of February the 23rd and March the 9th? Councillor Shell and Moffat. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that the minutes from the February 23rd, 2022 regular meeting and the March 9th, 2022 special meeting of Halliburton County Council be adopted as circulated. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, next up are delegations. Uh, this morning we have with us Mr. Elston, our uh, integrity commissioner, uh, who's here to give us his annual report for the county. Just be, uh, Mr. Elston, Elston has actually prepared a uh, an abbreviated presentation for council, so it won't be necessarily the same presentation materials that you see in your in your package. So, um, in case you're wondering, uh, that's that's the reason. Good morning, Mr. Elston. And thank you for being with us this morning. Oh, good morning, uh, Madam Warden. It's my pleasure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as I've been sitting here thinking about this, I thought I really need to abbreviate my abbreviated presentation because I know some of you have sat through uh, as I've droned on about these things over the last couple of weeks. I think there may be a municipality or two that I haven't got to. So um, I'll just really kind of hit the highlights. And I thought what I could do is um, maybe try and... Um, scope it a bit to your role as a county council, as opposed to your role in your local municipalities. Um, because I think uh, it's quite different, of course, you know, sort of your, um, the services you provide, um, you know, the functions, the area and, and everything. It's quite a different animal, if I can put it that way. So I'll try and, and uh, just provide a little sort of commentary on that. And I, I'm gonna keep it to um, under 30 minutes because I know you've got a long agenda and looks like it's shaping up to be kind of a nasty day out there. So I, but I guess we're, everybody seems to be at home. So, so that's good. Um, I have a little timer here I'm gonna start. So I know. So uh, I've just called this the structure and principles of effective municipal government um, because Really, that's what my role is um, in terms of how you folks structure yourselves, how you interact with each other, how you interact with staff and the public to be as effective um, as you can in your job. So if I could have the next slide, please. So there's three bullet points here and I'll... Um, you know, some of them are uh, are different for you as members of county council, and some are um, wouldn't be that much different from your uh, roles as local representatives. So the first main point is that municipalities are creatures of statute. 
which is, you know, it's one of those terms lawyers love to, to use, and it must have come from a decision a long time ago. But basically, you know, all the powers and obligations you have and your procedures all have to come from some enactment of the province of Ontario. And really, it's about four statutes. So, of course, the Municipal Act, which regulates, you know, 90% of the things that you do. Uh, the Municipal Elections Act, which is probably in the back or maybe in the middle of everybody's minds these days because you have an election coming up. And uh, I have a couple of thoughts on that just at the end I'll try and wrap up with. Um, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, which um, Integrity commissioners now have uh, jurisdiction to apply, and I find it um, one of the most interesting and sort of intricate um, statutes to apply to your conduct and your dealings, trying to decide whether you even have a pecuniary interest, and, and then secondly, whether you might be able to participate because you fall under one of the exceptions. So. Um, a, a big statute for you folks. Um, the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act really doesn't have much to do in terms of your role as governors, but I think it's always good to remember that uh, a lot of the um, communications that you're a part of uh, are subject to um, MFIPA applications. And the head of the institution um, will have to sort through um, the request and just see you know, whether or not the person making the application is entitled. And you, you, know, you may be surprised, I'm often surprised when I see things that you just feel uh, should not be um, part of the public <laughs> record, but in fact, they, they are uh, legislated to be there. So always good to just sort of um, keep it in mind. Um, the next bullet point, this is me trying to sum up everything in all those statutes and the, the common law um, into one sentence. So uh, council is to govern as a whole. And this is really an important thing to, to understand. And as long as everybody keeps this at the forefront, um, it makes life a lot easier. And so the point is that you operate as a group, whether in your role as a member of county council or in your respective uh, municipalities. So you have to work together um, to have any hope of, of uh, success in the things you set out to do. And you govern by resolution and bylaws of the council as a whole, not individually. Transparent and accountable way. Um, I sometimes worry that we've turned this into a bit of a cliche and everybody's talking about things being transparent and accountable, but there are two words that, that are important. And of course, you know, people need to be able to see uh, what you're doing and hear you in your discussions, uh, with a few exceptions. And accountability, um, whether it's to the electorate, whether it's to me, um, in a way that um, you know you can be held to account for the decisions you make and the actions you take. Now you have a broad immunity from a lot of things, but there are specific circumstances where as county councillors or local councillors, you can be held personally accountable. So uh, very much a part of your jobs and the governance model here. Free from conflicts and bias. Um, so conflicts, of course, we know the act, the Conflict of Interest Act talk, talks about pecuniary interest, but you also have to be mindful of personal and, and private conflicts. So, you know, as you know, your siblings, um, your interest is not deemed to be, or their interest isn't deemed to be yours, 
but still, that's a pretty close personal uh, connection and, and maybe presents a, a sort of an appearance of a conflict. And then bias, you always have to remember to come in to any decision in an objective way. And we're all human. We all bring all kinds of experience and perspectives. Um, but when you sit around the table as a group, you have to try your best, and I know you all do, to be objective and say, I'm looking at this question. I've got these facts. I've got this information at my disposal, and I'm going to make the best decision based on that, what's in front of me. And then finally, in a respectful and honest manner. Um, it's just really important that, and it's, and it's not so much, I don't think, for your personal feelings, although that's, it's, you know, never good for someone to feel intimidated or uh, abused in any way. But I think the, the reason why you have to be respectful is so that the, the folks that are at home watching or in the council chambers on the happy day when we get back to live attendances, they can see that you are there with cool heads and it's not personal. You respect each other. You understand somebody might have a different point of view. Everybody understands, you know, issues around your tables are sometimes passionate uh, beliefs held and, and people are advocating for your constituents. Um, but it all needs to be respectfully done so that the final bullet point, maintaining the public trust uh, is, is, well, the public trust is maintained. Um, and I think all of the, whether it's the laws or, or the, the principles uh, governing you or applied to you, that they all come down to maintaining the public trust. People need to know you're there on their behalf uh, with no personal axe to grind or uh, any uh, bias or, or personal agendas. You're there for them. You give up a lot of time, personal time, time from your business, time from your families. Um, so there's a sacrifice to it. Uh, and you're there for the folks in your community to make it a better place to help it through and solve its problems. So uh, that's the overview. Uh, next slide, please. So here, and I'll just, you know, talk generally, um, you know, the main difference here, the main point I, I try and make is, you know, as elected officials, whether at the county level or at your local level, uh, you're there to set the agenda. You know, you folks are the policy makers. You make the big decisions, how we're going to treat our uh, wetlands, um, how many feet of shoreline do we need before we'll allow a boathouse? Um, what roads are we gonna to maintain year round? Those kind of big policy issues. And then it falls on your staff uh, at both levels um, to implement those decisions. So in both your role as a county councilor and locally, uh, your job is you know within your the discrete um, requirements as a county councillor and as a local councillor, you establish the objectives and determine which services. And then you, you hand it off to your staff. And, you know, throughout Halliburton, I've over the last few years gotten to know a, a lot of your staff members and you just have a tremendous group of people in your own municipalities and at the county level helping you and that's that's their job to give you the um, advice you need the the information you need uh, they do the research they um, you know reach out um, and come back to you with answers to your questions but the key thing is they need to feel comfortable they need to feel confident um, they need to feel they can come forward and tell you, you know, what they've come up with in their, uh, through their research and their discussions amongst themselves, so they can report to you without fear or favor, as we say. They're not um, um, concerned about repercussions or reprisals. They're just telling you uh, 
here's the best advice we can give you. And then of course, it's up to you as a county councilor or a local councilor to decide whether to accept that advice or not. And um, that's absolutely fair. It doesn't show disrespect. Um, it just shows that, you know, as, as governors, as representatives, sometimes you take a different um, view of, of a particular issue or uh, come at it from a different perspective, which is fine, but it always has to be done in a respectful way again, and mindful of their um, reputations and, uh, and, and making sure they've got a comfort level coming to your tables, to your council rooms uh, to give you their best uh, advice. Uh, next. So my role as your commissioner at both levels um, is the same, uh, very same um, uh, powers, obligations, duties under the act, whether I'm the county integrity commissioner or your local integrity commissioner, um, no difference there. Um, same mandatory requirements in the code. Um, the, the province, the only direction they've given us is... Um, in a regulation that says you have to have something and you have to have a code uh, is in the act and the regs say your code has to have provisions to deal with gifts, benefits and hospitality, respectful conduct, confidential information and use of the property of the municipality. Um, we had hoped and you, some of you have heard me say this before that the province would come down with kind of a, a universal code um, so that we would uh, be applying it the same everywhere. Uh, your throughout Halliburton, very consistent. Um, I've never come across a, any kind of a gap or a big, you know, uh, difference between one of your area municipalities and another, or between your local government and the county uh, level. Um, basically, the same uh, same rules. My powers are the same at whatever level I'm, I'm operating at. Um, I have noticed um, because I act in a couple of counties uh, or districts and at the local level, it's, it is different. The, the questions I get, the issues I deal with, I think generally I would say <clears throat> much more action at the local level, if I can put it that way, uh, county, and district governments. And I think that's a function of um, you're just that one step removed from day-to-day -day things. A lot of the uh, things that you're dealing with don't become flashpoints, whether it's a, a minor variance or rezoning or um, some kind of a local matter. Um, so you, you um, I think, tend to have less friction less issues, I, I, I'm not sure, uh, but I would hazard a guess people don't watch county um, meetings as much as they watch their local meetings. Um, and I'm sure you're well aware of that, but basically the same, um, same principles and rules in place. Uh, next slide, please. If I'm doing a, um, an inquiry and I think I've never had a complaint um, at the county level in Halliburton, which is good news. Um, but when I get a complaint, there's sort of four basic steps to it. Um, I found at this, when I started doing this, which was about a dozen years ago, um, you know, it was pretty new. Uh, there weren't many of us doing it and, and we've had to kind of, I hate to say it, make it up as we've gone along, but I think a lot of us are trained as lawyers and have sort of brought some of the concepts. I started as a criminal lawyer, um, but uh, we are all familiar with the rules of natural justice and fairness. So that's how I certainly look at an inquiry. And I know the other commissioners would probably agree that it's all about um, having a, a fair uh, process where everybody, you know, can receive um, a natural justice. So an ability to 
state your case, uh, an ability to respond to what the other side is saying, and then to have a, a fair uh, uh, investigation. And then a report, which uh, I present uh, to council in um, open session. Uh, but it's important to remember that it's just my recommendations. So the province, you know, I think has done a, a pretty fair, reasonable job of leaving the ultimate decision making in your hands um, as councillors, whether at the county or local level. So I come to you and I say, here's the, the you know, uh, the complaint. I measured it against these parts of your code or this, these parts of the Conflict of Interest Act. I did an investigation. I talked to people. Um, and my feeling is there was a contravention of the code, in which case I say, I think the, you know, you can either um, uh, reprimand the member or there's a suspension of pay for up to 90 days. So um, I try and present these reports uh, in a way that somebody who's new to town or, or the, the situation can read it, understand, and, um, and then it, in, and help you make your decision. So if I'm recommending just a slight reprimand, that's kind of my way of saying, yeah, this was a transgression, but not the end of the world. Um, and so, uh, but um, maybe deserving of some kind of a reminder from council to just avoid that kind of behavior sort of thing. So uh, the, for me anyways, they take a long time. And that's the one thing that I just, um, I have <clears throat> terrible <laughs> sort of angst about that um, I just get backed up on these. And because I am so careful, I think to get it right, it just takes longer than necessary. So um, I'll sort of apologize in advance, but we don't have many complaints <laughs> or any coming from the, the county level. So you haven't uh, had to wait for me. Next slide, please. Just briefly on the Conflict of Interest Act, I know, uh, again, some of you have heard me go on and on about it, but it kind of breaks down into the first three bullet points here. There are the rules, which are, you know, fairly straightforward. They're not expressed in the clearest language, but I think the point is made if, if you have a pecuniary interest and the act only deals with pecuniary interests, if you've got a pecuniary interest, you have to disclose it and you have to tell the nature of it. And I think you probably have a form for that too. Uh, you can't participate in the discussion, you can't vote, and you can't try and influence the vote. And then 521 is the reference to staff. So all, so, uh, you know, uh, where applicable, those rules apply in your dealings with staff. Um, so the best example I can think of in your local uh, government, if there's a site plan application and you've delegated it down to your director of planning, you can't lobby the director of planning if you have a pecuniary interest. So that's the basic rule. The interests, there are really three kinds. Direct, which is obvious, you own the land, you own the company. Um, uh, indirect, and there's sort of two main ones here where people have to be careful. The, uh, if you are the um, uh, an officer, director, shareholder of a private company, um, then that company's pecuniary interest is your indirect pecuniary interest. Or if you're me a member of a body that has a pecuniary interest, and of course, this is always in something before council. Uh, and body isn't defined. I think, and I, I think we've all just sort of taken to giving it a pretty broad um, interpretation. So if you're a member of the Kiwanis or the Lions Club or the Chamber of Commerce, that's a body and you have to be careful of an indirect interest. And then deemed pecuniary interest, which 
is the interests of your parents, your spouse, or your children are deemed to be your pecuniary interests. So it's as good if your daughter owns the shopping center, it's just as just the same as if you own the shopping center and you have to uh, bow out. Uh, the difficult part is the exceptions. So there's a whole list of them. Um, and that's, I find, where I can be of assistance uh, to you folks, because, for example, is your interest the same as um, other persons in the municipality or part of the municipality? Um, so sometimes that takes a little thinking and and working through. Uh, is your interest so remote or insignificant that somebody watching isn't going to think you voted in favor of this because you have an interest? So, and the last point, code of con or uh, conflict of interest matters can either go to a judge or to the integrity commissioner. Uh, I think increasingly they're coming to integrity commissioners first. But if it looks like a bad one, we can ourselves take it up to a judge. And really the difference is a judge has a much broader, uh, more, I'll say draconian powers. Um, if somebody comes to me with a complaint and I find there was a conflict of interest, I can't remove somebody from their seat, but a judge can. So. If it comes to me and, and it's looking like a very serious breach and there were maybe some, you know, sort of significant financial gains as a result, then I have a duty to take it up to a judge uh, because they're, they have more power to uh, impose sanctions. Uh, next, please. Just last note on social media, uh, it's becoming an increasing part of um, our world, of course, used for good and bad. Um, the way I look at it, it's just another tool for you to communicate with your constituents, to um, you know, get council's message out, what you're working on, what your priorities are. So it can accomplish a lot. People follow Facebooks and Twitters and things like that, but um, always has to be done just as if you're on a soapbox, you know, in downtown Halliburton. <laughs> you know, you have to be careful what you say, how you say it, always respectful um, things that, you know, you just wouldn't say on, as I say, your soapbox, um, don't say on social media. And the last one, don't criticize staff. This is starting to become a thing. People, there's a problem. Um, they identify it as maybe staff didn't do quite what they expected them to do, didn't get uh, the quick result they wanted, and uh, counselors sort of um, kind of broadcasting that, which that, that has very serious repercussions, as I know you, you know. So... I think that was the last slide and I'm looking at my clock here. So I have five minutes left. I don't know if there's any questions on any of that. Uh, sorry to rush through it, but as I say, it's deja vu all over again for some of you, I know. Thank you. Uh, I, I had to chuckle when you uh, said that there's very little uh, friction or people watching county council because i think in the last couple of years that that may not actually be the case here but okay all right it's well just, it's just the way it's been um sorry, sorry madam morton <laughs> <laughs> no that's all right i wish it was otherwise the, the one thing that i would ask about is is um the the challenge that we all might have with with what what i would describe as a moral conflict um, you're, you're friends with someone or, or you know, you, you know someone that's having challenges and, and like, you know, it's very hard to draw the line there and, and, and determine that you're not in conflict when others may think that you are. So I, I wonder what you might have to say about that. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Morton. It's, you know, that I think those are the really tough ones. Um, pecuniary, everybody is worried about money and it's clear, but 
there are some times when you feel like you would be maybe abandoning a good cause or, or somebody who could really use your help or even your voice. It's not so much as your vote, but your voice to make sure that their interest is you know, projected. So those, those are the hardest ones, but we, we talk about personal and, and private interest. So it would fall under that and you know, I think it would be a good time to look at the um, exceptions. If the issue is something that might apply to a broad range of people in the community, then even though it's someone close to you uh, advancing it, um, I think that you're entitled and people would expect you to be able to speak to it. And, you know, maybe if you were to give me a call ahead of time, um, that sometimes helps um, because you may want to just explain why you're there, why you're participating in that particular matter. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Just letting people know that, yes, this is a neighbor, but this the cause the neighbor is involved in is something bigger than my relationship with my neighbor and something that I, I feel I'd like to, to be able to participate in. So I think there's a way of doing it, but always it's good to have your radar up. Thank you. Um, questions for Mr. Elston, Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Warden. Um, I'm glad you touched on the social media a bit just there at the end, because I think that's probably been the biggest challenge. Well, I'll speak for myself, but I, I would suspect other councilors, county councilors, experienced that as well that um, but particularly for myself I do not have uh, any um, mayor Facebook page or or Twitter or anything I just have Andrea Roberts however it's a small town we live in a small place you know you're you're one in the same I don't think that you can separate that whether you call put the word mayor or your title in front of it but the other thing is it's been quite a challenge to read comments about yourself personally that are really below the belt, very nasty, um, and just zip it. It's been a challenge. It really ha it has been. And uh, so, I mean, I suppose one thing is just don't read it is, is one way. But I do find that the people out there can say whatever they want. One person says this, and then it snowballs, and that thing becomes the truth, and you do not have a way to kind of defend yourself. It has been a challenge. That's all. It's just a comment. The respect part is not always a two-way street. Any other questions or comments? Well, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Elston. It's uh, it's always interesting to uh, to hear your thoughts and uh, and to just keep us on our toes about uh, uh, about issues that we could become involved in. Um, well, thank you. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, you know, it's my pleasure. I'm glad we get a chance just to touch base every once in a while. I, I am here, um, at, you know, at your service. And so if you have a question, um, please feel free to, to uh, track me down. I, I try and get back, especially on conflict of interest. People really like, get the agenda. I know sometimes you get it. You don't have too much notice. And so please uh, just try and get me. I'll do my best to get back to you. Thank you, uh, Madam Warden. Thank you. Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive uh, Mr. Elson's report? Councillor Roberts and Councillor Moffat. By Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Moffat. It resolved that Halliburton County Council receives for information the delegation from Mr. Harold Elston, Integrity Commissioner for the County of Halliburton. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, next are the uh, approval of reports and recommendations from the Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder to put this motion on the floor? Councillors Rael and Shell. By Councillor Rael, seconded by Councillor Shell, be it resolved that the recommendations from the March 9th, 2022 meeting of Halliburton County Committee of the Whole be adopted by Halliburton County Council. All in favor? That's carried. Madam Warden. Yes. Can I just, um, I just wanna let uh, actually the viewing public know as much as anything. We're having some streaming challenges, I understand. So um, I think it is streaming, but um, 
it may be necessary to refresh the screen on a regular basis. So um, the meeting is being recorded. It will be up on our YouTube channel as always. If anyone does have any difficulty, they can check later. But um, as usual, Mike's doing his best, but uh, there may be some intermittent challenges with the streaming platform this morning. Thanks for letting us know. I don't believe we have any information on joint, uh, uh, joint accessibility. So we'll move on to planning um, and uh, bring in Mr. Stone. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, warden, members of council. My apologies, we'll also be bringing in Mr. Farragan. I should have realized that you'd be here, Jason. Good morning. Good morning. So our first item is the community survey survey for the short term rental review. Um, if um, I'm not sure which one of you would be presenting that report, probably Jason. Thank you very much, Warden Dan and some members of council. Very happy to be here again with you this morning and to have the opportunity to talk about uh, the community survey that we intend to launch for the short term rental accommodation initiative. Um, I did bring along a very brief presentation, if it is okay with you, Warden, to kind of walk through the high points of the waves, if you will, of some of the key changes that we've made, and then obviously look forward to getting into further discussion uh, with County Council about some of the revisions that we've made to the survey. So Mike, if I could ask for your able assistance, please, I would greatly appreciate it. And maybe what we can do, Mike, is we can go just down to the to the second slide, if you will. That's great, and I'm just realizing that we built, um, uh, sort of builds into the presentation. So, but maybe we'll just go down to the next slide, Mike, if we could, and my apologies. So Warden Danielson, members of council. So we're um, wanted to do a couple of things uh, with you this morning, just sort of firstly to check in and talk about sort of the status on where we are in the process, but more importantly, talk about some of the changes that we've made to the survey. And again, as I mentioned earlier, to get your additional uh, feedback and direction. So just for context purposes, we are, as Mr. Stone has described in his covering report to our memo, uh, are firmly embedded within phase two of the short-term rental accommodation project. So this is the understanding and the direction phase. And I'm, as I'm very fond of saying, this is the phase where we sort of wrap our heads and our arms around the nature of the issue that we're dealing with and the associated opportunities and constraints uh, that it poses. And so that's the sort of study process on the left. And of course, on the right, are a series of sort of graphics which describe where we are within the context of the conversation with council and the community. So I believe this is the third opportunity that we've had to meet with county council uh, regarding this. So that's what this slide uh, is indicating and certainly many more conversations, both with county council and the community to come. Mike, if we can go to the next slide, please. So as council will recall from our last discussion, um, the community survey that you have before you this morning is the first of, of sort of two surveys that we intend uh, to conduct with the community. And really, the intent of this survey is to sort of explore the community's perspectives on short-term rental accommodations uh, generally. So we had presented a, a draft of the survey a couple of weeks ago, had a really great discussion, got some really great feedback, and then some subsequent uh, feedback from members of County Council uh, on the survey following that meeting, which we really really sort of appreciate. So since that time, we've had an opportunity to reflect as we've indicated in our report and we've made some additional changes to the survey, which we hope uh, is reflective of the feedback that we have received and is closer to the mark, if you will, in terms of County Council's expectations for the survey. What the slides on, on this, or what the bullet points, excuse me, on this slides are indicating is just some of the high level changes that we've made. And I won't follow this order, but I, but I will just sort of move around a little bit. Importantly, what we've done in the survey, and you see it in the red line, which we've attached to our report, is we have eliminated questions nine and questions 10 from the draft. So in our, in our meeting last time, there were some questions about the relationship between questions nine and questions 10 and uh, certain councillors had raised the possibility that those questions as framed previously 
uh, had had the opportunity to create some confusion. So we've gone back and we've eliminated those. We have included some additional uh, context setting information, if you will, at the outsets of the survey. Um, we have delved into certain questions. I believe that was Councillor Kennedy's suggestion to sort of get more deeply into both the benefits and the, and the challenges that are associated with short-term rental accommodations. We've separated out the categories of respondents to sort of better segregate um, uh, sort of the respondents and, and sort of the interests that they represent, if you will. And um, unlike the first draft survey, just sort of reflecting again on County Council's feedback, we did include some draft or preliminary questions, uh, if you will, regarding sort of, you know, potential solutions. And we'll have an opportunity in the second phase of this process to delve more deeply into obviously what the, what the solutions are, whatever those may be. We will know those at the time, but we thought just based on the feedback that we had received to, to sort of dip our toe in the water, if you will, and get sort of a high level assessment on kind of where folks are sort of feeling at this point in time. So with that, Warden Danielson, I'll um, sort of conclude. Those are the sort of the key changes. As I mentioned, we did include a red line draft of the survey uh, in our report, and we're, we're sort of happy to take any additional feedback from County Council on the, on the changes that we're uh, proposing to make. Thanks, Jason. Um, as always, we, uh, I for sure, and I, I know others appreciate the red line version. It makes it really easy to see uh, the changes that have been made. So um, I know that I, uh, I looked at it carefully. I had a, a, initially a couple of concerns, but uh, after consideration, I'm, I, I'm fairly happy with the survey, but I suspect that we have questions or comments uh, from other members of council. So um, questions, Councillor Kennedy. So thank you. And uh, thanks Jason and, and Steve for this update. Um, come a long ways from where we were a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'll just start at the very beginning. Uh, we, you're mentioning bed and breakfast facilities in here, and I, th I thought we were maybe not going to include those because they're not a typical short-term rental agency, but maybe I'm remiss in that. And if it is to be included, then there's some, I have some questions about uh, further on as to um, you almost exclude them bed and breakfast. I'm trying to think what question it was. Uh, whether you're gonna be oh, in residence or not, one of the questions you have is, uh, um, should be, or the, anyways, where the property owner is not there, then the bed and breakfast wouldn't be allowed, basically, because the owner is usually there. So just a bit of, I'm sorry, I don't have that question right in front of me, just in my note to start with. Um, also, I had a question, um, a phone call from somebody, uh, where does home sharing fit into this program? Um, I don't know if it's if it is such a thing, but uh, it was just a, and I didn't have an answer as to what, whether that's a short term rental or or just what what that animal is. So if we could uh, if we could just take that one back. Um, also, a couple of agencies reached out to me about the uh, uh, your comments about the short term rental industry within the county is not known. Uh, apparently, you know, there is a, it's not just anecdotal information. There are a lot of agencies here and uh, just hoping that you're going to reach out to those agencies at some point during this process because they are a wealth of information. Um, just generally question three, um, you, you've got the age groups. This may be something that, I, and that uh, works with surveys. I don't know why we're asking how old you are um, as far as, as your comments, if you're under 18, or if you're over 65, I, 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 that may be something that has to do with how you set up surveys. So that was just a comment I had. Question four, I, I, I would ra I'd rather see, use the number of days uh, where you say periodically a couple of times a year, if that could be translated into just days rather than, I don't know what that means, uh, regularly once a month, is that a week a month or is it just, uh, just a, a little more definition? Um, on that one would be appreciated. The uh, question six, I had to, when I read this one, I said, that's just not short-term rentals. That's anybody that has a cottage on the lake has those same same concerns or may have them. And I thought maybe if we combine six and seven, you just get the, the top five. I think you've already done that, but I don't know if there's any easier way, but when I go through that list, um, 
it's those are concerns that people have whether you're renting the cottage or not next door. Uh, I just I know we have to find out about that, but the uh, there's some questions there about septic tank capacity. I don't know if anybody knows what the septic tank capacity is of their neighbors. Um, and then how often would you have concerns? I would, my issue with that is, goes to question nine, have you contacted municipal staff? Um, have, you know, what was the outcome if you did contact municipal staff? And that would be the secondary question. So have you contacted municipal staff? Yes, what was the outcome? Was it actually a short-term rental complaint or was it an owner complaint? And are you going to follow up with each of the lower tiers to see how many complaints have been received and, and what the, the, the uh, uh, strong ones were? And uh, question 10, sorry, I'm dragging on here, Madam Ward, and I'm almost done. Um, no, I do not support- We'll have to go back and look at each one of these questions yeah. that you're raising, just, just yeah. to reach agreement. Go ahead. Uh, Question 10, no, I do not support short-term rentals. And I, I don't know why, just myself, um, if, if the general statement. Um, here's question 11. Do you feel short-term rentals should only be permitted at a property owner's primary residence when they're not being used? Um, a bare Airbnb or uh, b, &B br breakfast, uh, are the owners always present? So that was the confusion there and then the home share. Um, and then question 12 again, uh, use the days per year rather than just a couple of times a year or more than once a month. And do you feel short-term rentals should not be allowed on properties where the owner does not reside? Uh, yes or no, and, and why not would be a uh, reason I'd like to know. Uh, the uh, question 14, I think it's a great question. You, you alluded to it and that this is a, starting to look into the regulatory thing, which I think is great. And it goes back to, I, I would like to have seen a fact sheet at the start of this that uh, explained that, um, you know, what an accommodation tax is in a Coles Votes kind of version so that you could answer that question, payment of an accommodation tax by an owner. That would give you a little more information. I, I'm sure most people don't even know what that is. So to be able to answer that question, just a fact sheet outlining those kinds of things. Um, uh, Question 15, should be a higher fee when the owner operates not reside? I, I don't know why it would make much difference other than you relate it back to the number of days that you're going to rent the, uh, your property. If you have a, an occasional number of days, less than 15 days, less than 20, maybe has a fee and then a higher fee if, it's, if you're renting it out more. Um, and then what tools uh, do you, a question I'd like to see is what, what tools do you as a renter or short-term rental use are using local agencies, VRBO, Airbnb, or other, uh, word of mouth or whatever. When I go back to the uh, 2019 uh, Tourism Department survey, 12% uh, of the visitors who came to Halliburton County use short-term rentals. It's the largest single category besides owning a cottage um, that we have here, and I would really like to find out, drill down whether it's um, local agencies that are providing the, the bulk of the service, whether it's Airbnb or just uh, friends and neighbors. So um, that that's, that sort of sums up all my questions. I think we've moved a long ways, and I'm, I'm sorry to take up uh, so much time, but I uh, still feel that we're on the right track, and just those are just the questions and comments I had. Thank you, Madam Warren. Now we have to deal with them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Council Rail. Yeah, I have a question similar to what uh, Councillor Kennedy said. He was talking about home share. I was wondering if something like timeshare would be included. Here you've got multiple owners uh, under possibly a corporation who own the property and they select times at which they're going to be attending. So are they short term rental or are they permanent? And if so, would they fall into this general category? And the other thing that, that we were talking about, and again, in my case, it's, it's six. I have a, I, I don't have a problem with what we're trying to collect in terms of information that makes sense to me. Having said that, when we did this in Highlands East, we found out that some of these things really, although they may be collected in a survey, they don't really belong there. And, and things like loud music, I mean, does it really matter whether it's a rental or, or, or someone having a party for, for, for another reason? Fireworks is, is another example. Um, you know, those are kind of things that, although I, I understand why we're collecting them uh, in the survey, 
I believe that when we come down to doing the nuts and bolts of it, we'll probably find that they belong in another bylaw where everybody gets affected by it, because I don't think we should be signaling out long, loud music just because you're a short-term rental. Loud music is loud music, period. And so, uh, you know, and firearms is another one that's there. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, we should be doing that. So, but that, that's my concern. Councillor Moffat. Uh, thank you. Just to um, uh, Cease's uh, point there that around timeshares and and I guess the comment from uh, Councillor Ketty as well around home share. Um, the, the, the home share idea, I certainly had uh, some comments on this last time because this is the guise, this is the ruse of Airbnb where their entire existence is built on what I keep saying, allowing the widow Mildred to stay in her little place so she can, you know, live in her liver and she rents a room to the nice couple from France. That's great, but that's not what we're talking about in Halliburton County. So home share is the name. Um, it's, it's the same thing. So if, if you're talking about somebody who rents a room to a student who's going to the college, that's different than someone who's buying a property and renting it to strangers every week. So it's my understanding from our previous conversations that that we wanted to tease that part out and, and, and specifically focus on waterfront uh, short-term rentals that are, you know, not zoned correctly, paying taxes, getting inspections, annoying their neighbors. I mean, you know, we have annoying neighbor issues all the time. You're right, Pat, about that. Uh, but I think that's the, uh, this isn't about timeshares like at, at Wigamog, and this is, isn't about home sharing. It's, this is about straight out commercial rentals in residential, in waterfront residential properties, is my understanding from our conversation. Other comments or questions? And then we'll go back to Jason to see if he can respond to or have some suggestions about the uh, comments made. Um, Councillor Moffat. I, I jotted down some answers to Pat's questions too, um, because some of the questions uh, came from some feedback that I had provided. So I could maybe provide some context around where they came from or, or my impression, but certainly Jason's the lead. So we'll okay. let him carry that. Well, uh, go for it then. Who, me or Jason? Um, if, if you want to go first and then uh, Jason, we'll look to Jason to try and wrap things up. Bring yeah, yeah. If, if, if you'd like, that's okay. I'm happy to help. Um, I think we also, um, uh, Councillor Kennedy's question about um, like who, who, who the people are uh, about uh, asking, is the intent, Pat, were you looking for the people answering it to say what platform they use to rent their property out to others? Because we had talked about and decided at the last meeting that we didn't want to ask the users of rental properties because they obviously think it's great and there are no problems. So we took that part out. So if we were gonna add in sort of, who are you? Like what platform are you using? That, that's, we're asking our community. We're not asking visitors to our community. I, th I thought that was the idea around that, but anyway, I'm not gonna fight you for it. I just, that's just my comment on that. Um, question four in terms of the relationship, um, the people talk in a couple of times a year and once a month, people don't talk in days. So I, I, I just wondered if people, people might not go and count. They might set, they might, might be easier to capture a generalized time frame, which could be refined in, in the second survey. So get people to say, get them to answer and say, yeah, you know, it's a couple times a month. It's not seven and a half days or whatever. That was the idea around that. Um, and, uh, I don't know, you want me to keep going? Uh, on in question, what's now question six, the big long list, the septic system capacity, that could just be a language change. I know at for uh, up in my neck of the woods, the thing that I hear the most often is, you know, it's a little cottage from the 1950s and it's there's no way it has a septic system that can accommodate 14 people on a weekend. So I guess what we're looking for is, do people have concerns that, that short-term rentals in older places uh, are overburdening the existing septic systems because there are no inspections. So that could be, you're right, someone isn't going to know the, the leader capacity of their neighbor's septic system, but you, you can tell if 
there are too many people in a place for its age. That's sort of what that's going for, but that could be, um, that language could be refined a little bit. Uh, in the, the question about, in question number nine, have you ever contacted the township, your township or your elected official? Um, that actually was something that came from, uh, Lake Bays asked that question. And the reason they asked that question when they did their survey a couple of years ago, and they had, they had a really good response from their survey, is, is it intended to prove the circular point, is to find out that people are angry, but they don't call anybody. Uh, and why didn't you call anybody? Because you won't do anything or you can't do anything. So then that speaks to enforcement. That's what that was meant to capture. Um, but, and, and again, anyway, it can be, it can be changed, uh, certainly enough. And I was wondering too about the, the limits, the, your same question about on question 12 about the limits is it's, you know, a couple of times a year, once a month, because that's what, pe that's what people think. And then if, depending on how people answer, then, you know, Jason said, there's going to be a second survey where there'd be refinements and maybe in the second survey, that would be where the refinements would live. Those, so those are just my comments in response to Councillor Kennedy's uh, thoughts. Councillor Roberts. Um, yeah, thank you, Warden. I'm not really sure how we're going to go through this because Councillor Kennedy did come up with, with, a, with a whole stream and I was not writing notes, so I don't know where we're at. But in terms of, it, it is just a survey. It's, it's, you know, a starting point for us. Um, and I, I think I said it the last time, I, I do, I, I think the changes that have been made are, are great. And you, you know, listen, Jason, to, to the comments that came out from our last meeting, but things like in question six, say septic system capacity, if, if the question is, is asked and in your opinion, is this a concern? It doesn't matter if it's a brand new build or a 60 year old cottage, if that's that person's opinion that septic system is a concern, just check the box. That's what we're trying to look at. Or what are the concerns? And here's the list. There's a brand new place on Drag Lake. That's actually the concern that I just heard of from, and I, you know, from somebody. Doesn't matter if it's new or not. Um, so, you know, I, I, that's, I just, for, for question six, those are just people's opinions. And there's always usually a, a, a thing that says other. So you have another, you know, you're able to elaborate all the way through this survey. You're able to elaborate right at the end in sentence form structure, bullet point structure. If you don't find the little box that you can check. I think we're just trying to get a bit of a snapshot of what are the pros, the cons, the concerns, the, the, all of the, the sort of feelings and conceptions and uh, that this is this is the public's opportunity to get that back to us. So I don't think we have to nitpick too, too much. We just have to make sure there's always that um, that extra clause that like to to further explain or further explain. And I just don't want to get too caught up in the weeds of the study. That's all. Thank you. And, and you know, I, I should apologize. I, I probably should have uh, st stopped Councillor Kennedy at one question at a time and that's to deal with it because we, you know, now we're, we're going to have to go back and look at some of it. Um, uh, Councillor Moffat. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I agree with Councillor Roberts. Like we can, we can beat this to death and get every, like we'll, we'll never get it right. No matter what survey we put out, someone's going to say that's a terrible survey. So uh, Councillor Roberts is right. It's just I just wanted to clarify Councillor Kennedy's questions. Um, I think I think it's it's a matter of um, capturing as much as we can that is then refinable in the second survey. And, and I think that's what Mr. Farragut's intent was. And as has been noted, <laughs> we hired him for so. Um, the, the first issue that uh, Councillor Kennedy brought up was whether or not bed and breakfast should be included in this survey. And I mean, it, it, it's my position that they should be, but I'd like to hear uh, hear comments about that or thoughts or possibly a response from uh, from Jason. Um, we'll start with uh, Councillor Moffat, then Councillor Shell. Aren't um, our uh, bed and breakfasts are they're they're zoned to be bed and breakfast? Are they not? It's a zoning question to Mr. Stone, I think, um, and so they wouldn't count because they already exist and they're being operated within existing regulations. So that's not who we're trying to, to address. We're, we're trying to address the non-regulated 
um, rentals would be but, my thoughts. But is someone offering uh, the same kind of service or offering with, without being listed as a B&B? If you're operating, sorry, may I? I mean, if, if, you're, if you're illegally operating a and b as that is you're renting a room and you're living there, you're staying on site, then you're operating an illegal B&B and you should be that person, that should be addressed under, it's a, it's a zoning violation. Anyway, I'll let the planner talk. I'll let the planners talk or get that one out. <laughs> uh, Councillor Shell, and then we'll go to the planners on that one. That was going to be my comment. I actually think that Airbnb, or pardon me, not Airbnbs, that's totally different. Bed and breakfast fall under um, a, a zoning, and I think it has to be in place. And I also think that, you know, if you have somebody as a bed and breakfast, 99.9% .9 of the time, the owner is on site and responsible for the guests who are there unlike an Airbnb where you're just renting out a cottage and, or, you know, whatever, and you don't know who's there and what your neighbors are having to deal with. So I, I think it's a separate, completely separate. Okay. To the planners. Uh, who wants to respond? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. Most, most only bylaws would have a definition of what a bed and breakfast is. And they typically are the list, the number of rooms and the fact that the resident is in, in the building in the house when they're renting out those rooms. So it's to draw a comparison, um, as you know, with short-term rentals, they're, they're, uh, the regulatory uh, uh, framework in Ontario has been ever shifting for the last two or three years. Um, and it's not to say that at the end of the day, this council's uh, will uh, look at what, and I think this is what uh, Jason will do ultimately with the project is to determine whether or not there needs to be a regulatory framework based on council's position on it. And does that show up in a bylaw? Does that show up in a license, uh, which is more of a bylaw passed under uh, the municipal, municipal act? So those things are yet to be seen. Um, certainly as Jason does his survey that he's going to sort of pull on those uh, opinions from, from the community uh, so that council can see it all ultimately. Comments from Jason. I would, thank you, Warden. I would support what Mr. Stone has described and, and the discussion brings me back to our first conversation around short-term rental accommodations and the relationship between bed and breakfasts and lodges and hotels and motels in the county versus the Airbnb model, if I could use that term uh, for the purposes of this discussion. And as I recall at that time, um, to support what Mr. Stone has said, as well as uh, Councillor Moffat, the feedback that I recall receiving at the time, it was very much focused on, this initiative was very much focused on the, on the short-term rental accommodation in the Airbnb model, given the fact that uh, bed and breakfasts, as an example, are regulated and have been regulated in Ontario for, for several decades now. And um, this study is an opportunity to look at, I think, the differences in approaches between those two and an opportunity for County Council to consider potentially harmonizing the approach amongst those commercial rental opportunities to ensure that there's a consistent and equitable and a fair playing field, if you will, for any commercial sort of operator of accommodations within the county. Uh, so I'm so I'm not clear on what you're suggesting that there that B and Bs remain in the survey or not? So through you, Warden, I'm I'm recommending that air that B and Bs. Sorry, I'm starting to get confused in my terminology. B and Bs are specifically excluded from the survey, and I believe what Councillor Kennedy is reacting to potentially in his initial comment was we had specifically referenced bed and breakfasts within the introduction to the survey. And in that sentence, we were saying this does not include bed and breakfast, lodges, hotels. So there may have been a, a reaction to the word, if you will, and then as it sort of played out through the survey itself. But the intent is not to include bed and breakfasts within the context of, of this particular survey. Um, then I would suggest maybe the wording there, the first paragraph of... Um, uh, of your lead in would need to be changed a little bit because it says such as B&B, but do not include hotels, motels and 
Like, yes, you are one one hundred percent correct. My apologies for that. My intention did not match the words on the page, so thank you for that clarification. That then clears up the questions later on with other ones. So thank you, Jason. No, I appreciate your pointing it out, Pat. Um, just as a as a comment, I do I did like the idea of of uh, the additional questions that Councillor Kennedy recommended. Um, uh, under number nine, uh, the uh, what was the outcome if you contacted municipal uh, uh, staff? I, I really do like that addition. Um, I also, in number 10, like the uh, asking why you don't support uh, short term rentals. I think that that's important to, to hear that, as well as uh, number 13, uh, asking why. Okay. So uh, other other comments or concerns or un, unresolved matters, Councilor Roberts. Okay, thank you. Just on question 12, um, I'm just wondering if there's a better way to word that where I'm talking about the limits because as an example, the prime time would be July and August. So there's no box to check that. There's a lot of people that do use their properties to rent out and they put it in a little calendar and whatever weeks are open for all of July and all of August, but they use it themselves the rest of the other 10 months of the year. So um, I'm just wondering if there was a slightly better way to word it in terms of that you, so no, there should be no limits, that's clear. But all the other ones, um, no more than once a month, but no more than a few weeks a month, maybe just even adding one to limit and, you know, yes, but no more than so many months in a year or something like that, because there are people that's exactly what they do is they'll have it on their, their, their calendar for July and August. So I just don't know if that's captured there. There might still be people that want to check that box and support. I suppose they could put the other, but I don't know how other counselors feel if that's that was quite clear there. Were there any, did anyone else have an issue with that question and, and how it's worded? And if so, maybe a suggestion about uh, how it could be worded. Um, Councillor Robertson and Councillor Rail. Just if Jason had a suggestion there, like, like am I, am I, are we missing one more box or should we just leave it and let that person put other if they wanted to answer that way? So through you, Warden, that, that was the intent of the other box. However, if council wants to be very explicit on that, it's a very easy change to make. Um, and I also appreciate the, the seasonality comment that Councillor Roberts is sort of is sort of making there too. So I would, I, if it's okay with council, I would suggest just let Steve and I reflect on that, and then we can sort of talk about tweaks to that question to to sort of reflect both the frequency and the seasonality piece that you're describing. Councillor Roberts. Uh, Councillor Rael. Yeah, I'm not sure, but just bringing up two, two groups of people that, uh, that are not traditionally uh, in the summertime. And we have a lot of people come up here for the changing of the colors in the fall. And they'll come in mm -hmm. and they'll rent for, for, for three or four days, take in the colors and uh, really enjoy the opportunity. And then the other group of people, which is now starting to grow a bit more than we had before, and Mother Nature plays a big role in that, is snowmobilers who come up and skiers who come up in the wintertime uh, to enjoy what snow we have, because obviously if they're coming from the southern part of, of, of Ontario, uh, they may not have as much snow as we have. So I, I'm not sure how that should be worded or if it, if it should be worded at all in the way that this particular section is, because it would skew the, 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 the July to September uh, normal mode because it would take you out into, into late September, October, and obviously into January and February. Other comments? I'm hoping uh, that, that council, that, uh, that we can go forward with this survey uh, rather than it coming back to us and that, uh, you know, we can, we can trust in Steve and Jason to, to have heard our uh, heard our concerns and, and the things that we'd like to see added and for it to go forward. If that sounds reasonable to everyone, uh, Councillor Moffat. 
And remind me, I apologize if we discussed this last time and I can't remember, but um, uh, to Mr. Farragut, what's the uh, what's the plan for distribution of this survey? I'm assuming um, weighed in will be used, the county site, and then we'll just sh it'll just be shared through various existing channels to get the word out to encourage people to to uh, do the survey. Through you, Warden, yes, that is correct. Um, our intention is to promote the survey through both the county and the um, lower tier existing communication channels to ensure that there's a, a wide of possible of a distribution of the opportunity for folks to provide their perspectives and their comments with us. Any other comments, concerns, or unresolved questions? Okay, um, I could we have a mover and a seconder to uh, to accept the report um, as amended, Councillor Shell and Councillor Kennedy. So I have amended the resolution a little. So bear um, bear with me. Um, moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Councillor Kennedy. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received the March 23rd, 2022 staff report entitled Community Survey for the Halliburton Short-Term Rental Review as information, and that Halliburton County Council direct JL Richards to incorporate the amendments as discussed and initiate the community engagement phase of the short-term rental review. Does that work for everyone? All in favor? That's carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your meeting. And you, oh, the rest of your day. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Stone, the next is a request for extension of a draft approval file. Yes, thank you. Uh, Warden to the rest of uh, County Council. Uh, this is uh, common practice uh, when developers have challenges, uh, clearing conditions. Uh, this one, as you know, Notice has been around a while since '92, and uh, the uh, there's so, been an ownership change. So the new owner is uh, now in the process of trying to clear those conditions. So the request is to uh, grant that extension for another year, and hopefully it'll be finalized by then. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's a file that's been in place for a long time, so it'd be nice to see it resolved. Yeah. Are there any questions or concerns uh, with this request? Could I have a mover and a seconder to support it? Councillors Burton and DeVolan. Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor DeVolan. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received the March 23rd, 2022 staff report entitled Request for Extension of Draft Plan Approval or Draft Approval of a Plan of Subdivision File uh, 46T91001, Bishop, and for, for information and that Halliburton County Council amends the approval of the draft plan of subdivision submitted by Greg Bishop for lands located in part lot 17, concessions nine and 10, geographic township of Stanhope, now in the municipality of Algonquin Highlands, to extend the lapsing of draft approval to April 27th, 2023. All in favor. That's carried, thank you. And finally, your uh, planning department update. Yes, thank you, Warden, to the rest of Council. Standard, standard report that uh, Council reviews every month. Uh, I guess the most exciting thing is we had a bumper crop of consent applications at the Land Division Committee. And this next month, we should have uh, similar numbers. So that's exciting. Uh, one of the things on the, the planning office, I want to just point out to uh, Council that uh, this last uh, week or two, we've had some really interesting inquiries for residential developments uh, in, in the two villages. So that's exciting that uh, there's interest with uh, developers uh, sort of in the GT area, uh, looking out uh, beyond, beyond Toronto to communities like ourselves. So uh, we'll be initiating uh, some preliminary uh, consultations uh, with the township staff and the development interests. So that's, that's positive. Um, also, the, you'll note that the climate change coordinator wanted to just bring uh, to Council's attention what the United Nations are doing uh, with regards to climate change. So with that, uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions on the planning department's update? 
Councillor Devolin? Yeah, the bathymetric uh, data, uh, how soon uh, will that be uh, available and is it intended or can we request uh, with respect to dredging in those uh, uh, areas where it's problematic uh, that that ask is either made and or, or what their intentions are with that, please, Steve. Yep, thank you for that question. So the uh, we've received data from one of the contractors and we're still waiting for final processing to be done by two, uh, two of the other contractors. And then that will uh, be given to the Conservation Authority for input into the models. The other thing that needs to happen this spring is uh, Kortha Region Conservation Authority has to do field work where do, they're doing survey work in and around the uh, dams, just so that they know, I guess, uh, the top elevation of the dam structures. And then that will be put into the uh, model as well. And we're hoping, uh, you know, through, through the summer that we'll have uh, the model be up and running and we'll be able to generate some maps in that regard. Go ahead, Councillor Devon. Yeah, and, and included in that, uh, there's been various members over the time, but there's been some members of the public that have been involved with Councillor Moffat's coined Utwump uh, that uh, have no shortage of expertise uh, generally about uh, these sort of issues and specifically about our watershed. I would say that it would be most helpful with either as a group or some of those uh, folks on that that committee that have the technical expertise at least peripherally be included in the conversations. And if I can uh, respond to that. So yes, uh, we actually made a presentation to that group uh, this week. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the technical persons actually reached out to myself and uh, the Conservation Authority. And there has been an exchange of ideas and the Conservation Authority is really thinking about what uh, the technical suggestions were made uh, by the group. So uh, we're hoping to carry on uh, with that type of relationship this summer. Councillor Moffat. Yeah, thank you. When, uh, when this project first began, there was um, quite a large uh, meeting of the mines in Peterborough and um, CEWF at that time had a seat at the table. And uh, I know as, it's, as the project has moved along, that's been... Uh, reduced to focus specifically on the on the field work and and the lidar work, uh, but I don't know if there's any uh, if the existing exchange of ideas that Mr. Stone has referenced is adequate, or if there needs to be a seat back on that advisory group or whatever. I'm not sure what even form it's in right now, but I think the important thing to Councillor Devold's point is that the the incredible expertise of of some of those folks is is um, is is used where necessary because they do have a lot to offer. So I'm not sure about this, the seats, Mr. Stone, I don't know if you can speak to that or what council thinks about that. Well, I, I guess the only thing I would say with that is right now, you're absolutely right. It's really a technical exercise for us to collect the data and then have the conservation authority uh, prepare that data so that they can uh, put it into the model. And I, I know with, uh, uh, the comments that we received from uh, uh, the Conservation Authority will be looking at, you know, a, a robust response to the model to make sure it addresses some of the uh, local contexts that, that have been raised. So uh, we have, uh, um, there isn't what we call a technical advisory committee just yet in function. It's more a team of, uh, team uh, based on uh, what the Conservation Authority staff and county staff, but we're certainly open, open to uh, developing a technical advisory committee, but we would have, as I said, uh, uh, in our meeting this week, we'd have to prepare terms of reference and have council consider that as well before we move into that process. So that would be the mechanism within which you would um, ensure the, uh, the expertise of, of those individuals that have been mentioned? Certainly, and, and other groups that are currently not in, involved in, in the technical side of things. Are there any other comments? Okay, could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the uh, planning department update? Councillor DeVolan, 
Seconded by Councilor Roberts. Moved by Councilor DeVolin, seconded by Councilor Roberts. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received the March 23rd, 2022 staff report entitled Planning Department Update for Information. All in favor. That's carried. Thank you, Mr. Stone. You're welcome. We'll move into administrative reports. And uh, first up is the correspondence summary listing. Any comments? Could I have a mover and a seconder to receive the uh, correspondence listing? Oh, Councillor DeVolin had a comment. Sorry. Yeah, and I guess we have it electronically, not even on paper. Uh, it's hardly worth the value of the sheet of paper, this response. Sorry to be kind of the negative Nelly this morning, but to say that I'm ticked would be an understatement. Councillor Moffat. Um, yeah, I don't disagree. Um, and uh, I do working trying to get that preliminary discussion with, with uh, MNRS staff, which is intended to lead to our bigger conversation, but you know, it, it's March. But ever hopeful, we'll go through the motions and have the conversation, at least lay the groundwork. And uh, you know, whatever faces are at the table, this table, uh, you know, in, in several months, somebody somebody will either continue or pick up this thread, whoever, you know, wants to do that. And it, I think it's important to keep it moving. And there's another issue on the agenda later on that it all ties together. And we need to, uh, we need to remain really attentive to this, this kind of issue. So, I mean, I'm willing to keep plugging away at it. That's for sure. <laughs> It's like, a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Give me a challenge, give me a project and I'm there. <laughs> um, any other comments on that? Uh, could I have a mover and a seconder then to uh, accept the correspondence listing? Begrudgingly, <laughs> Councillor Kennedy and Councillor Moffat. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that the correspondence listing for the period of January 18th, 2022 to March 16th, 2022 be received for information by Halliburton County Council. All in favor. That's carried. Um, next is a report on affordable housing. Who's going to be giving that report? Yourself, Mr. Rudder? Yes, I will. Um, so um, this is, this is a, uh, a proposal that you have seen before, but it has been amended um, because of, as, as many of them are, as they, uh, as they uh, continue to uh, reevaluate the financial model, they often amend the application. Um, this also includes a recommendation to, um, for the county to fund the uh, water and sewer connection fees. Um, Council will recall that we had some conversation and, and uh, Council directed us to find a more equitable way to, uh, to deal with water and sewer connection fees. Uh, I've included and, and uh, the report was drafted by Michelle Corley and uh, as according our terms of reference has that the CAO will present the report, but I did have um, some input into the report around the conversation about uh, uh, user fees and connection fees, um, and uh, and so uh, please know that those are my <laughs> those are my comments. It's not the city of Cortha Lakes weighing in on on our policy development or our budgeting budgeting. Um, the what we're finding is that uh, those water and wastewater systems are user pay, and the connection fees are an important part of the financial modeling. And so it's really not an option to just forgive those fees. They really do need to be paid. Uh, so the question becomes who pays them? Uh, the, we are also finding that it is more cost effective to develop uh, housing and multi-residential in particular uh, on municipal services. And so um, I guess having more of the subsidy funded by the county ensures that the costs are spread more evenly across the tax base. But we also wanna make sure that we come up with something to ensure that affordable housing is developed in the unserviced areas as well. And so um, we, we weren't able to finish our policy work, but I do wanna uh, commit to council that um, I know that uh, City Corps of the Lake staff are doing a great deal of research and I've done some research to find out what the additional costs of building that uh, treatment in unserviced areas or the, the, wa the water and, and wastewater treatment uh, capacity in, in unserviced areas. 
uh, and also the operating, the additional operating costs of that. So we are we're trying to find out that data, and we will come back with a a uh, recommendation um, with some policies to to uh, I guess provide at least a comparable incentive or one that would be sufficient to encourage more development in unserviced areas. So um, we don't have that work done yet, but we didn't want to delay this process. The developer's anxious to get moving forward and um, it is uh, 18 two bedroom units, six of which are affordable. And so uh, we wanted to bring it forward as soon as we possibly could so that development could proceed. So um, I've, I've outlined the incentives in the report. Um, some of them are, are us paying fees, the $28,200 for the uh, water and sewer connection fees. There's a pre-consultation fee waived. And then the rent supplement, which would be funded through our typical city of Kortha Lakes uh, shared services or, or uh, uh, joint services uh, budget. And so that's $76,818 annually for 20 years. Questions, comments? Councillor Devolin. I'm going to preface this by saying anything we can do as government to get some more places for people to live, I'm, I'm for. But there's kind of two thoughts. There's the for-profit and non-for-profit and incentivizing at whatever level in terms of support. And then um, the next thing is, is um, kind of whether at the county level or the municipal level. Uh, I can think of two instances in in a non-for-profit context that while well, I've been around, uh, the municipalities picked up the tab and the, the, it, it was in the order of the services, the roads and whatever, around $300,000 plus the land that Minden Hills did. I'm, and again, I'm not trying to hold this up. Just We just need cognizant to be cognizant of having a policy that, that we uh, have all that in it and the, the groundwork and the rationale. And, and that doesn't mean I'm against this. It's just the thoughts that come to my mind as I look at this, because this is a bit different from what comes to us before. Having said that, the landscape has changed uh, in the last few years. So just, again, not, not against this and not whatever, but I just think we need to continue those thoughts and formulate uh, a clear path with policies that are understood and supported across the board. Thank you for that, Councillor Roberts. Um, if Mike wants to answer and then I'll hold my question. Um, no, no, I think it, it's a great point and something we're really aware of. I think what we are trying to come up with is a balance. Um, I know that the, the, the fees that you or the caught the expenditures that you referenced are sort of the construction of the water and sewer. And what we're trying to do is in this policy is, is um, pay for connection fees and, and those would be a little bit different. It would still be up to the local municipality to provide the construction of the service, but the county would be funding through the affordable housing targets program connection fees, which would help offset those costs. Thank you for the clarification. Councillor Roberts. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and just to be clear, so we don't have, uh, it really is in this case, a, a sewer connection fee because we do not have town water. And the proponent is still, because it's gonna be multi-residential would be responsible for entering into a water agreement with the municipality um, because we don't have town water. Otherwise you hook in and that's that. But uh, so we'll have to deal with that at our end. Um, and, but I do want to know, because this is very new, is the rent, rent supplement and housing allowance. That is an extremely large amount and I don't know how that got calculated. And um, if, if that could be explained, I do know that the proponent at one point was asking Dysart for tax deferral and we kept saying we have never done that before. And while that might be one of the one of the things that municipalities can do, we weren't comfortable with it. So I guess that request is off the table is the tax deferral portion. Um, so I just, so two, two questions there, sorry, the rent supplement, how does that get calculated and the tax deferral? 
Mr. Rutter. My, my worst fear is that someone would ask me that question about how that number is calculated. And, and uh, so I can get that information. It is something that comes through our annual budget through City of Cortha Lakes. Um, the only thing I would I would say is it is a large, num large number, but if you remember our our the target uh, setting process we went through, there were um, a substantial number of units that uh, like 500 of our 750 were requiring rent supplement or or housing allowance. So um, it is really an important part of the mix. Even it is expensive, but it really is an important part. Um, you know, 250 units were, were proposed to be developed by uh, government or 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 uh, not for profits. Um, the the other 500 or so units were really were counting on the private sector to build those and using things like rent supplement and and uh, and uh, housing allowances. So um, I, I can I will follow up and get the calculate how the the method of calculation, but. Um, it, it really is uh, a reality and, and it saves an, an incredible amount uh, of, of tax dollars, you know, that are, you know, capital and, and operating costs. Um, so while it's, uh, while it's a big number, it wouldn't be as big as if we were building the, the projects ourselves. Uh, I'm actually glad that uh, Councillor Roberts asked that question because I had a little bit of, of problem with the numbers. Um, and, and how we arrived at that, if, if the rent supplement for this application is for six units, that, that annual amount seems like an awful lot of money. So look forward to the clarification. Uh, Councillor Moffat, then Councillor Rael. I'm just wondering, I'm putting together uh, Mr. Stone's comments uh, in his presentation. He said there's interest from some developers uh, coming into Minden, I think he said, and then adding to, I'd like to connect the dots, and then Councillor DeVolan's comment and the, and the language in the report about the development of policies that provide, um, you know, equitable opportunities and access. Uh, so I'm just wondering if um, there seems to be, I guess the question is to Mr. Rudder, there's work in, work is ongoing, but not yet complete in a number of areas. And I'm wondering if uh, if we can, if we're going to ensure that those policies merge with at the rate of development so that to Councillor DeVolan's point that there is that equitability across the board um, so that the development doesn't get ahead of the policy development. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I guess my, my only, um, our hope is to have those uh, policies or draft policies in front of council in the next couple months. Um, I know staff have, City of Cortha Lake staff have set some time aside to draft the policies and it, that's in the next, I apologize, I don't remember the exact date, but it's in the next couple weeks that they're going to do that. And, uh, and then we'll review those and hopefully have them in front of council for consideration in the near future. Great, thank you. Council Ryan. Yeah, Mike, just a, a quick question on, on this, because you were very specific on $76,818. Uh, is that a fixed amount for annually for 20 years, or is there a cost of living uh, going to be taken into consideration as we move along? Because you're projecting, you're projecting a long way out here. You're, you're trying to get a handle on what's going to happen 20 years from now. Um, is that going to be enough at that point in time, do you think, or, or are we just... I'm not sure how this is working. I'm not against it, by the way. I just want to know what the impact is. Over 20 years, that's a million and a half dollars. Uh, and then again, you look at it from the point of view, it's only one project. And we could have many projects going down the road that would require the same level of importance, the same level of funding. And, and we want to make sure that at the end of the day, we can afford what we're doing. So uh, again, back to the original question was, is this fixed or is it subject to cost of living? I, I, I guess I'll commit to get that answer as part of my uh, my query to City of Cortha Lake staff about how the, the number is calculated. Um, but I, you know, as I say, I know it's a big number, uh, but, you know, County Council established targets of 750 units and over 500 of those were to be, uh, the incentive to be used was rent supplement or, or uh, um, housing allowance. So it really is an important part. So I will commit to bring back that information so council is more comfortable with those decisions moving forward. Councillor Kennedy. Yeah, I just want to take a, a, a moment here just to thank you, uh, Mr. Rutter, for your efforts on this file. 
I think it's really exciting when I read it that uh, there's going to be uh, specific efforts made for uh, unserviced areas when I'm thinking about the higher courts and the Carnarvons and whatever. It, 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 we need housing there as well. And so this is an opportunity given the cost of raw land, which is really a, a problem now to trying to build housing. But any kind of an incentive like this is, I, I just, I think it's awesome. So I thank you for your efforts that I know you've had a lot behind the scenes on this one. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, is council comfortable with moving this forward, uh, uh, knowing that uh, we're going to get clarification? Okay, could I have a mover and a seconder then to approve this request? Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Kennedy. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Kennedy. Be it resolved that the report from the County of Halliburton Affordable Housing Target Program Steering Committee report to Camp Council intake COH 2021-04 be received and that subject to the necessary bylaws and agreements being forwarded to council for approval and the successful completion of such planning and development processes as may be required, the recommended revised application received through intake COH 2021-004 of the Affordable Housing Targets Program, providing a total of six affordable housing units in the municipality of Dysart et al. Uh, be supported as described in table one and that the revised municipal incentives identified in table one of the report be approved. All in favor. That's carried. Did you have a question, Councillor Rao? Oh, okay. Um, next up is the, uh, is the discussion on the detachment board appointment process and administrative support options. Um, if you would like to give us that report, Mr. Redder. Sure. So we, uh, a couple things, I guess, have intersected uh, that resulted in this report. And, and uh, so uh, Councillor Moffat, as chair of the committee, and I had a conversation and, and she brought a couple things forward as we, uh, as we sort of uh, discussed it. And you'll recall that one of the amendments council made to the um, or the, I guess it was the steering committee made as, as uh, you move forward is that uh, rather than the head of council alone being appointed to the detachment board, it allowed for the opportunity for a designate. And so um, I guess the questions came up about, you know, who is that? Is, should there be policies? Should they be at the local level? Um, and, and in all likelihood they would be, but um, you know, what, Will councils have the option of appointing uh, non-council members as designates or will it just be council members? Um, how will those uh, municipal appointed citizen appointees be chosen? So there is one who is uh, appointed by council, not the province. Um, and uh, how will that be done? Will it be county council? Will it be the local councils? Will there be other some other mechanism? How will the detachment board be compensated? Uh, will rates be established and paid by local municipalities? In other words, will they, could they be different uh, based on your own um, uh, uh, pay structures or will that be the county or some other mechanism? Uh, will the county or one of the local municipalities coordinate the administrative functions, including the financials of the detachment board? Uh, will these costs be invoiced to the municipalities? Will they be shared equally? Uh, I'm, I'm starting to sound like Councillor Kennedy. I'm just asking a whole bunch of questions here. So um, the, uh, will the costs of, of the detachment board be shared by the local municipalities only or will the county pay a share? Um, they're just a, a series of questions. Um, and, then, and then the whole issue of secretarial services. So council will recall that you've approved the creation of a community safety and well-being plan coordinator for lack of a better term at this point. Um, and, and there will need to be secretarial services, which I, it, my experience has been that the OPP does not provide those services. They are provided by the municipalities served by the board. Um, and so is that, are those duties something that council would like our community safety and well-being uh, coordinator to, uh, to take care of? So um, what we're recommending, because there are so many questions and, and the steering committee was actively involved in this, um, staff are recommending that the steering committee uh, meet once again, uh, one more time to discuss the above noted considerations. And, and those are just ones that uh, Councillor Moffat and I uh, came up with. There may be a dozen others. She may have a dozen others, um, but uh, the, uh, 
Those are just some examples of the questions that I think we need to work through now that the plans have been approved and, and the local councils have endorsed the seven member uh, detachment board concept. Um, comments and or questions, thoughts? Uh, we'll start with Councillor DeVolan and then uh, Councillor Moffat. Yes, we should meet. <laughs> uh, uh, it's clear and succinct. <laughs> Councillor Moffat. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I agree, and I think that um, the community safety well-being coordinator, navigator, whatever we're calling, it, is the ideal person to liaise between the two um, bodies because they're connected. Uh, one of the challenge I did reach out to some contacts, and um, it was the intent that the uh, regulation that would provide direction that would answer some of these questions was meant to be in place by the end of this year, and it appears that because the development of the regulations has not yet occurred then some of the, what I call the marching orders, the direction from the province on, on, on how to run these boards um, hasn't, hasn't been developed and implemented and distributed yet. So uh, what that does um, is some of the questions that are in the report that we've talked about cannot yet be answered, I think, until the province develops and implements the regulation that, that governs it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't talk about things internally uh, about that. And then the other question is what just, popped into my head a minute ago is we haven't had a CPAC meeting in two years or more. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, police service boards and CPACs have actually officially been dissolved. Do we want to continue to have a working relationship with, with our policing services in the interim, or do we just wait for the detachment boards in 2023 to get up and running? It would seem to me that it's, an, it's a, a huge loss of communication that, that we've had in place for a long time and, and for there to be that kind of lengthy gap um, would be unfortunate, but I would look for thoughts. Councilor Roberts. Sorry. Um, yeah, I thought for some reason, uh, Councilor Moffat, I thought the CPACs were dissolved once. Yeah, I know. I thought they were. Now, we have a very open and uh, willing detachment uh, commander at, at our local OPP who would, I'm sure, if we wanted to call a meeting with the heads of council, would, would get together. I'm not 100% sure of the benefit of that right now. But yeah, so to Councillor DeVolens, yes, let's uh, have a quick meeting. I'm sure um, Mike Rutter can hardly wait to send out a doodle poll to us and see how our calendars will jive. But, you know, that's another thing. Um and what was the timeline that we were looking at advertising for that coordinator position? If you can remind me, I cannot recall. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, so we had, um, we have drafted a job description. We have evaluated it with the assumption, and it was a big assumption that the secretarial services for the detachment board would be included in the job description. Uh, we've been reluctant until council gave us some direction in that regard. Um, to actually uh, advertise for the position. We had budgeted for nine months. Uh, so we are, we're ready to go anytime. Um, I, would, I would honestly look to council's direction if you prefer to wait until after the steering committee meet again uh, so that that direction can be finalized. We'll put that on hold until that happens, but we do have nine months of budget uh, for the position. Go ahead, Councillor Roberts. Yeah, just to follow up then, if that's the one little thing, I think that that would be a very, um, I, I would support keeping that in the job description that the secretarial services are under um, one of their duties. So then we could then go out, if you've already rated it and you've already got a job description, I'd be supporting going out anytime soon. Don't know how others feel. Councillor Moffat. Could we use the phrase administrative support instead of secretarial? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I agree with Councillor Roberts that, uh, that I, I think we're sort of hearing generally that the uh, that responsibility would lie with that individual. Um, would Council agree that we can go ahead with posting the position or, or is it your wish to wait until we've had uh, another meeting? Councillor DeVolan? Uh, knowing how long and arduous any hiring process is, I hesitate to pause for anything. Okay, I'm seeing nodding heads. So we can go ahead with that. Um, so could I have a mover and a seconder then to uh, 
um, to recommend that the uh, steering committee meet and deal with these issues. Councillor DeVolan, Councillor Moffitt. Moved by Councillor DeVolan, seconded by Councillor Moffitt. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received the March 23rd, 2022 staff report on the detachment board appointment process and administrative support options and that staff be directed to schedule a meeting of the Community Safety and Wellbeing Plan Steering Committee to provide some administrative policy direction for consideration by the appropriate councils. All in favor? That's carried. Um, if it's all right with members of council, uh, although it's kind of in the middle of administrative reports, before we move into public works, I'd suggest a 15 minute break. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, we will reconvene at 11 o'clock. And we're back live, Warden Danielson. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda are a couple of public works um, items. So we'll bring in uh, Mr. Sutton. Actually, Warden Danielson, it'll be uh, Sil Cluche presenting this report. Uh, Director Sutton had another appointment he had to attend. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Sil. Good morning, uh, Madam Morton and members of council. Um, this morning I'll be presenting two reports and I'll start with the uh, road, rehabil re road rehabilitation project. So the surface treatment and hot mix uh, projects. Um, during the 22 uh, budget, uh, staff identified numerous for uh, with serious uh, considerations for priority in uh, the rehabilitation for 2022. Um, staff do have uh, noted that uh, budget due to pre budget pressures and um, labor and uh, material costs and availability, and as well as the current event world events. Um, that uh, it has worsened our situation in regard to tenders um, and, and receiving uh, good pricing, um, which has um, affected our, our, uh, our uh, hot mix and surface treatment tenders uh, being above our budgeted uh, costs. Um, staff have... Uh, prepared this report to provide council with the possible cost savings options in regarding the overall re rehabilitation program. Surface treatment tender uh, is a joint tender with the Township of Algonquin Highlands, which closed February 24th. We received three tenders with a, a variety of pricing. Um, the tenders were uh, reviewed and um, Miller Paving has um, done this type of work in the county for many years and are recommended for award. In order to complete the surface treatment um, as identified in the budget, um, the, the cost would uh, um, we would have a, an additional cost of 167,000, um, the contract value um, higher than the um, budgeted estimate for 2022. Staff initiated discussions with the low bid 
to review possible sa uh, cost savings options. Uh, the discussions with Miller Paving um, were productive and they agreed to hold the unit prices in according to the following options. So we had three options to present. One, uh, option number one is to do the entire um, con um, proposed budget uh, amount. Option two is um, everything but County Road 15. So subtract the single surface on Road 15. And option three is to remove a single surface on 15 and eight to reduce the, the, uh, the costs of the total amount um, of the, of the uh, tender. Um, staff believe that uh, the sections on County Road 11 and 18 and 19 are of highest priority and should be um, considered this year for the resurfacing. The hot mix tender was closed on March 17th with two bids received, um, which the lowest bid from Fowler Construction and uh, staff recommend that they be awarded the contract. In summary, the tender values of the surface treatment and hot mix have come higher than the original budgeted for 2022. Staff recommend that the surface treatment option one, as well as the uh, entire hot mix tender um, move forward. The cost of the recommended is uh, much higher than our, our budgeted and it would require additional transfers from road reserves of $618,778 approximately. Staff understand that this is a significant amount to transfer from reserve and have provided um, a few cost savings options for council to consider should uh, you wish to reduce the required transfer from reserves. The total, the total of both contracts uh, is four million one hundred seventy-four dollars and seventy-eight cent, uh, seventy-eight seven hundred seventy-eight dollars and thirteen cents. So, noting this is approximately seventeen percent over our twenty-two approved budget, um, and will require additional transfer from reserves. Um, this will result, if, if uh, removed from our reserves, this would result into a 22 year end balance of approximately 575,000. Sorry, um, is there any questions? It's, it's okay, um, it's, it's a big one. And, and it, you know, there's a couple of points that I'd like to make. I, I, I'm always hesitant to see us reduce our reserves to that extent, but I, I also can't see this work ever becoming any cheaper by deferring it in any way, shape or form. It's been identified that the work needs to go forward and, and it just isn't gonna be less expensive, but I would look to the comments from other members of council. Councillor DeVolan, then Councillor Burton. Well, I think we're probably all gonna be in the same page. Uh, the new cost realities are not temporal and going away. This is the new reality. And uh, I think the uh, lessons of the past, deferring to this is uh, the increased cost for future council will be more than this. And uh, I think we should move ahead. And obviously with respects overall to reserves in a subsequent year's budget, whatever should look at that as a, as a secondary thing that we may need to take other measures to make that more robust. But uh, I think we should move ahead as you've uh, said, Warden. Councillor Burton. Uh, thank you, Warden. I certainly agree with uh, with Brent's comments, and uh, you know that I, I suppose that's one of the reasons why we why we do have reserves. And I certainly uh, am not in favor of seeing our, our work uh, lax in any which way. Councillor Rael. Yeah, I got a bit of a 
<clears throat> challenge with it too, because we know what the cost is right now. My concern would be if we put another winter and a spring into these roads, is the cost not only gonna go up by inflation, but is it gonna go up because there's more work needs to be done because we didn't do it this year? So if we, if, if, if Sylv can basically tell us that, yeah, it's gonna be a lot worse if we don't do it this year, then I think we need to do it, period. I think that's a given. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I do believe that if, if we don't move forward with her program that we can, we'll definitely fall behind. So unless someone says otherwise, I'm hearing that we move forward with the projects as, as originally intended. Could I have a mover and a seconder to that uh, extent? Councillor Devolin and Moffat, thank you. Moved by Councillor Devolin, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received for information the March 23rd, 2022 staff report recommended 2022 road rehabilitation projects. Further, that Halliburton County Council award the surface treatment contract, uh, contract 2022-9-A to Miller Paving Limited for the amount of $2,242,239.80 plus applicable taxes. Further, that Halliburton County Council award the hot mix contract, contract 2022-8-B to Fowler Construction Company Limited for the amount of $1,000,000. $860,333.05 plus applicable taxes. And finally, that the warden, that staff be directed to present bylaws authorizing the warden and CAO clerk to execute both agreements. All in favor? That's carried. Next is the replacement of culverts. Thank you. Um, the replacement of culvert, uh, we have a under. Uh, we, we identified culverts uh, under County Road 16, the section that will be resurfaced this year. And uh, we identified seven culverts that need replacement prior to resurfacing. And we, this uh, work was budgeted under our 22 capital structure budget. And um, a tender closed on March 17th, which we received eight bids um, of, uh, of a variety of, of uh, pricing, um, quite a spread between the highest and lowest, uh, of which uh, Young Construction has uh, recently uh, satisfactory, has performed satisfactory work, uh, especially on the Eagle Lake uh, Bridge Rehabilitation for the last uh, couple of years. As such, uh, staff recommend uh, awarding the, uh, the contract to Young's Construction. Councilor uh, Burton. Councilor Burton. You're on mute. Thank you. And through to uh, Sylvan. Sylvan, I can't believe the difference in the, in the bids and, and I just, Certainly hope that uh, the lowest can, can follow through and I just can't get through my head why the other ones were so high. Just a comment more than anything. Yeah. Councillor DeVolan. I'm of the same mind as Councillor Burton. The good news is it's a known company that's financially solvent and whatever that will follow through in my opinion. If it was an unknown quantity uh, of some others that we don't have personal knowledge of, I would be uh, unbelievably hesitant to support them, but in this instance, I am not. Madam Warren. Go ahead. Um, yes, uh, the staff do um, believe that the contractor can fulfill the, the contract. Uh, they have, I, I know for a fact that they did uh, go on site and review the site and they asked many questions. So um, I believe confidence in them and uh, it's nice to see a little bit of savings there that uh, helps offset things from our previous report a bit yes yes it, it is below our budget we're in a sector again on the replacement papers. roberts and Councilor. 
Moved by Councilor Roberts, seconded by Councilor Burton, be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received the March 23, 2022 staff report, replacement of culverts on County Road 16. Further, that Halliburton County Council award the contract for the supply and replacement of seven culverts on County Road 16, contract 2022-5-J to Young's Construction Limited for the bid amount of $226,798.65 plus applicable taxes. And finally, that staff be directed to present a bylaw authorizing the warden and CAO clerk to execute the agreement. All in favor. That's carried, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sil. Okay, next up is a report on our mileage rate, which I, I believe is quite timely. Uh, uh, yes, uh, Warren Danielson and Council, we, uh, in a conversation with the local CAOs um, we, that we have on a weekly basis, we, the subject of mileage came up. Um, that was after uh, we had heard some discussion uh, at department heads that the library board was considering uh, reviewing this as well. Um, we have a bit of a, a you know, there's a different uh, approach taken by different municipalities. I believe Dysart has just uh, directed a review and, and made some changes to their policy um, or are proposing them. And uh, some of the local municipalities actually tie to the county rate, which is 45 cents per kilometer. Um, and so uh, what we're asking for is direction to proceed with a review and prepare a report for council's consideration. Comments? Councilor Roberts. Um, thank you. Yesterday at, at Dysart's council meeting, we um, passed the policy to uh, align it with the CRA rates for the year. So um, whatever that is, I believe it's, it might be sitting at, I don't know, Councilor Kennedy, if you could remember, was it 61 cents for, or 59 cents? Anyway, it doesn't matter the rate, we're gonna tie it to CRA and then that's, we don't have to change it there. There's something that sticks in my mind that it was, 59 cents for so many kilometers and 61 cents or, or the other way around 61 for so many kilometers and 59, but uh, I think we're, we're going to look at a review. Councillor Moffat. <clears throat> Until you said what you just said <laughs> about there possibly being um, confusion on the specific, specific rates, I was going to suggest, I was wondering why we needed a report if Dysart's already changed theirs. Um, but anyway, based on what you said, we just need to make sure those numbers are reflective of what's out there. Uh, Mr. Rudder. Um, the, the rates are, the CRA rates are actually in the report. It is 61,000 or 61 cents for the first 5,000 kilometers and 55 cents thereafter. Councillor Moffat. I'll take the 61,000, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but again, I, like, I guess my question is, do we need to have a report if that's what the CR rates are like what's do we need to go back through the whole bring it back another report another discussion i agree um council burton and i certainly agree as well with uh, with what carol just said uh, warden councillor devolin yeah if we're going to hitch our wagon to the cra let's just do it i agree any dissenters i'm seeing nodding heads I suspect that uh, that will change the resolution. Yes. Um, Go ahead, Councillor Moffat. Just a question that we had this, as Mr. Ryder mentioned, the conversation was held at the library board. I know this, I'm very well aware this is county council, not the library board. Uh, will the library board then have to come back and align with this or can it be standalone? Cause it's not, it's a different rate that, that was approved. If you want to respond to that, Mr. Rutter, I, I believe that the library board has the ability to make their own individual decisions. Yes. Um, could I have a mover and a seconder for the resolution then, please? Councillor DeBolin, Councillor Moffat. Moved by Councillor DeBolin, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council received the March 23rd, 2022 staff report on mileage rates proposed review, and that staff be directed to amend the county mileage rate policy to reflect the CRA reasonable allowance rates. All in favor? 
That's carried. Thank you. All right, next up are reports and minutes from external boards and agencies. And we will start with the uh, Halliburton Corps at the Pine Ridge Health Unit. Any comments, Councilor Roberts? Um, not particularly from those minutes, um, mainly just from our last meeting last week. Uh, I, I did ask the um, our, our medical officer of health if she thinks and visions that there will ever be an opportunity to uh, accurately capture the number of cases, et cetera, um, because you know, we know the case count is only, it says it's going down, but it's not going down, I can assure you. Um, you know, hospitalizations are and all those things. I just wondered if, if there was ever a thought sort of at the provincial level to do any kind of studies or, um, you know, when the dust settles and we're, or we're on the other side of COVID, just to get a little bit of a snapshot of what, what really happened in these last few months from the time of Omicron hitting. So um, she didn't really have quite an answer for me, but uh, you know, they talk. So. so that's all. If anyone has any other questions on that, uh, on the minutes or, or any the Board of Health, just ask. Councillor DeVolum. Well, normally with these types of events in this scale, provincially or federally, there'll be a review or an inquiry, whatever. Usually there's a passage of time, uh, a year to five years sometime, that I think a lot of this will be known. And I'll bet you that in the next five years, there will be more doctoral dissertations uh, by PhD students in uh, Ontario from those either in the medical side or economic development or, or other statistics than you can shake a stick at. So I think to Councillor Roberts' uh, question is, I think within five years, there'll be more analysis than you can shake a stick at. And we'll know a lot of the details uh, that that to date, the date is a bit messy and, and certainly doesn't ask answer uh, our questions with the specificity that we would like. Councilor Roberts. Um, this is a, a, a separate issue, but there were some um, changes to our budget because we actually passed our budget back in September, but that does not reflect or does not affect, excuse me, uh, the municipal partners uh, portion whatsoever. It's all reflective of COVID. So it's money in from the province um, to still deal with uh, COVID for 2022. And so it doesn't affect our request or the, the um, partnership funding there. Thank you. Um, point in time, Councillor Shell, anything to comment on? Not really. We met last night and the majority of the meeting was spent discussing policy, so <laughs> nothing really. <laughs> well, you'll let us know if they make any significant changes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, okay, next is the uh, uh, a report on the Warden's Caucus. We did have a meeting uh, last week and I, I must say it was really nice to meet in person. We had our first in-person meeting and everybody was there. Um, and it, and it, it just showed a marked difference in, um, in the atmosphere and the ability to be able to talk, you know, with individuals and, uh, you know, it's something that we've all missed for a long time. And uh, so it was quite enjoyable. The, the primary purpose of the meeting was to look at our uh, strategic direction for this year um, as guided by Mr. Matheson, um, who is, uh, he really does have his ear to the ground when it comes to, uh, to provincial policy and, and direction and, and how we might approach things. So it's, it's always good to hear from him. Um, as you might imagine, our priorities did not change substantially from last year. Uh, because the, the priorities are the same and, you know, right at the top, affordable and attainable housing for everyone. I mean, it's just a massive issue. Um, also on the Ontario health teams and, and the governance of those teams, the structure of the teams, uh, there's still a feeling that there should be and must be a municipal representation on those teams, um, given our increasing responsibility for health. Uh, so we will continue to advocate for that. Um, a slight change in, in uh, approach for for health issues is a greater emphasis on uh, human resources for healthcare um, and, and in particular for family positions across the board. Um, but, th but that also includes, uh, you know, other healthcare professionals like um, nurse practitioners and, and nurses because the shortages uh, 
uh, remains pretty dramatic across the board. The other thing that we were able to uh, to have the caucus agree to, um, at least in additional advocacy, um, was community uh, paramedicine and trying to see that program expanded across the province. We can see how much more support that will be given the challenges that the health system is is having that community paramedicine is is one of the answers so they've agreed uh, not to make it one of their top three priorities but definitely uh, right after those and and strong um, advocacy with respect to that item uh, the the only other thing that i wanted to report on was uh, a request that i made uh, to Mr. Rudder without the benefit of having asked you all for your support. I, I spoke to several members of County Council. I've asked Mr. Rudder to order a Ukrainian flag. We have a structure that supports an additional flag and I, I think that we need to show our support and our caring for our, our what, you know, whatever Ukrainian community we have in the county and, and for those people who are impacted by, uh, by what's going on in Ukraine. I, I, uh, can't talk about it anymore because it almost brings tears to my eyes. Hopefully uh, you can all agree with, with that request that I've made. Otherwise, uh, we will, if there's no questions, uh, we will move on to joint uh, social and housing services. Anything to report there? That's a quarterly meeting and the next one's not until June, Warden Danielson. Okay, thank you. Uh, anything on professional recruitment that you'd like to bring to us, Councillor Moffat? Uh, nothing to report. All right, there's a set of minutes from the library board. Um, anything that you'd like to draw our attention to, Councillor Roberts? Well, you know, it, it is a sort of highlight, and thank you, Warden, for that. Under library service challenges, uh, we are experiencing staffing challenges, just like a lot of organizations, and it's very hard in the um, smaller branches where they have, uh, they're not, you know, oh, they're three hours here and three hours there to staff those branches, and the library is going to have to take a really serious look of making sure that uh, we're, we're, it's not our role to close branches, but it's our role to staff them. So we, we have uh, an obligation to serve all four corners of our county, but it, it on a go forward basis, it might be quite a challenge. So just, it, it's there, no decisions are being made. I think it you know, got picked up a little bit by some people, um, but, but as the board has to do their best to operate within their budget as well. And, um, you know, great, try to find the right staff. Uh, and maybe there's alternate models um, that, that we can look at in the future. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any questions uh, on the library board in the minutes? Okay, um, I'd like to have a mover and a seconder to receive the uh, reports from external boards and agencies. Councillors Kennedy and Moffat. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that Halliburton County Council receives for information the following. The February 17th, 2022 approved Halliburton Kawartha Pine Ridge District Health Unit Board of Health Minutes and the February 9th, 2022 Halliburton County Public Library Board approved minutes. All in favor. That's carried. Uh, next is the uh, County's Land Division Committee uh, report. bring in Mr. Stone. I must say that uh, uh, Member Kennedy, you missed a bit of a barn burner of a meeting. Uh, it, there were more applications and in one meeting than we've seen in a long time. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, I, I noticed that. I want to thank uh, <laughs> Councillor Roberts for taking my place. I'm sorry I didn't realize you were going to get the, the full brunt of that. Uh, and, and more <laughs> and more delegations than we've had in a long time. Oh. So anyway, I mean, it, it makes it interesting. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Roberts, I could just speak that it, it was an interesting uh, meeting and, and bringing people in, etc. Um, but uh, I, I've it's one of those things that because on one particular file there had been a previous application, a lot of the people's comments were based on the previous application and concerns with that. So um, the 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 um, agent, you know, was trying to steer it no this is this is what that is and um 
So I don't know, Steve, we've got you on screen now if you wanted to speak to that. It, so it is hard when, when an application comes in one format and then three years or two years or whatever it was later comes in a completely different format, but the neighborhood and people circulated still had those concerns. And then um, it, it was deferred that one file, uh, it'll come back in a sort of cleaner format because I believe a change it to the access which might resolve a lot of the concerns was more or less decided by the agent during that meeting. So, yeah, but it was, it was, yeah, I took one for you. It was like, let's, I did let's it say recommend 9.30. Let's say I recommended you by the agent, not decided by. <laughs> Sorry, yes, recommend, yeah, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Stone. Yes, uh, thank you, Warden to rest of council. I, I do apologize for the length of the meeting. I had technical difficulties with, learning how to share share my screen. <laughs> Thank you to Councillor Robert. She bailed me out a couple of times there. So that was great uh, learning exercise. Uh, yes, we did have a lot of applications uh, presented to the committee. So that was exciting, um, 13 in all. And uh, we had four that were deferred. Um, the one, the Paris, uh, parish application, there was a lot of a lot of discussion on that particular one, but in the end, the committee did the right thing, deferred it for uh, the agent and applicant, giving them the opportunity to amend the application. So uh, that was good. Uh, the three other ones were deferred to allow uh, Township of Mind Minden Hills, the opportunity of uh, looking at them. So that we're hoping they'll be scheduled for uh, the April meeting. So that that's that. The other thing too that we did, uh, uh, we introduced a new uh, report format uh, to the committee and it was well received and we had a fulsome discussion afterwards uh, in other business and we'll do a few more tweaks to it and hopefully uh, we'll have a, a, a wonderful product in April for, for the committee to consider. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Could I have a mover and a seconder then to receive the land division activity report? Councillors Roberts and Shell. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Shell. Be it resolved that Halberton County Council received the March 23rd, 2022 staff report entitled Land Division Activity Report for Information. All in favor. That's carried. All right, other external boards and agencies, uh, any update for us on good roads, Mr. or Councillor Burton? Uh, yes, thank you, Warden. Um, just, uh, just a couple comments more than really an update, but our conference is rolling along. It's scheduled for what in two weeks now, I, I guess it is. And we'll be having our board meeting there as well, our next board meeting there as well. The registration is just, uh, I guess a word I'd use is almost overwhelming. Uh, I think your comment when you said about meeting with the uh, the warden's caucus, it was nice to to meet and sit and, and be in, in person. Our conference is certainly gonna be in person and that, uh, like I say, the numbers are just uh, unreal, unheard of actually. And so we're pretty excited about that. Um, but I do have, uh, with our road school training and skills development, I do have some good news coming. I can't share it right now. Um, a lot of people would uh, probably understand why, but it is, it is a real good news story. And I'm hoping I can share it with, uh, with County Council um, at, our next, at our next meeting. It'll be after the conference, but there is quite an announcement coming. Well, we look forward to that. Thanks for the teaser, Dave. <laughs> uh, Councilor Roberts. Yes, we'll wait with bated breath. Um, in terms of, do you remember the, uh, what I brought up uh, regarding snowmobile crossings on county roads um, and uh, Good Roads was going to sort of look into that if, if during your conference or anything, if there's any, any information that you could bring back from that uh, regarding materials, costs, what other areas uh, do, if that would be appreciated, maybe report back after the conference. We can certainly do that. Thank you. Um, any ERN update that you'd like to bring to us, Councillor Devolin? No, we're we're awaiting the, the the busy building season. Our duty to consult and those things are uh, proceeding. But uh, I'm sure after our meeting in April, uh, I'll have lots to say. Thank you. Look forward to that. Anything on poverty reduction? No, I was 
uh, I had conflicts and missed the one that was at the first of the month, but the, uh, the um, minutes of the meeting will be coming forward to us in the not too distant future, which I'll uh, comment or uh, answer any questions that I can at that time. Thank you. Under other business, uh, we have the uh, meeting calendar for April. Are there any errors or omissions? All right, we've got a couple of discussion items. Um, one is on the uh, province seeking input on floating accommodations. I believe Councillor Moffat might like to speak to that. Um, yeah, I can. Thank you. I had asked for this to be at the county table. I think uh, we all received the ministry's notice of the public consultation on the matter. It's um, a significant issue with potentially huge, huge impacts for areas like ours. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I know that um, other communities are already actively involved in reviewing and addressing, you know, challenges that they're having um, in their particular areas. Um, I feel that it dovetails with the work we're already doing on things like lake health and external impacts, um, um, shorelines for sure, and um, maybe even short-term rentals. And I think especially it's relevant to our work with uh, that we're trying to do with the ministry about um, overuse or misuse of certain parcels of crown land. And technically uh, the ministry has control over lake beds. And so there is this, you know, um, push me, pull you situation where uh, the, they're deemed to be vessels, but they're, you know, they're outside the purview of our, of our zoning. Um, anyway, it's a bit of a muddle and the, the ministry wants to address it. And I would like to see us make a submission. So how we go about making that submission, I'm not sure, but certainly looking for, um, discussion and support from council on, on putting something together that's, um, relevant to all the work we're currently doing. I agree. It's, it's, uh, it's really important. And it's funny, I hadn't really thought of it in terms of short term rentals, but that's absolutely true. Another experience to offer people. Um, Councillor Devolin. Yeah, uh, I'm completely supportive, Councillor Moffat on this. I've been dealing for five years with one on Sawyer's Lake, and they've cutely tried to call it a boat and put numbers on it. But then there's a whole set of legalities that were not there. And then when that didn't, work then they uh, took the numbers off and they want to consider their structure and definitely given the height uh, that was a problem and doesn't comply uh, under the building code whatever it's been a shell game and, and to additionally add the complication of short-term rental accommodations is just another layer it is a total mess and I would say this categorically those things that are under the uh, jurisdiction of the provincial and federal governments on this issue, they have been AWOL. They've been absent without leave on both of these and neither level of government has lived up to any level of their jurisdiction or responsibilities. I sure agree with that. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's disheartening when you try and resolve things, uh, you know, like the misuse of Crown lands and, and the kind of responses that you get. Like, thanks. Thank you ever so much. We'll, we'll look into it. We'll get back to you. Um, I, so I, I'd like to see this separated out from that for sure. I found it interesting to see an article that Councillor Moffat provided that showed that one particular incident, um, the, the structure was deemed to be a vessel by the ministry which, you know, really creates a su supreme problem. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think I brought up in Algonquin Highlands years ago was the issue of zoning for lake beds, uh, which I believe is something that we can do. And, and I think it's something that we all need to think about to have greater level of control over these kinds of issues. Councillor Kennedy. Yeah, I, when I read this, the first thing that came to mind is we've had an issue in Dysart where um, a person had an oversized docker raft and when we tried to deal with that and we were bylaws they got a ruling from Transport Canada that it was a vessel so I'm not sure where that file is at at this time but that's, it, 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 it muddies the water for lack of a better term when we have this kind of uh, disconnect between our local interpretation and a federal one so I, I'm all in favor of working to, to try and find some kind of resolve to this how you could call a dock or a vessel is beyond me, but uh, Councillor Devon and then Councillor Moffat. 
Well, I would say there's parts of the southern United States and, and certainly in Asia that, that they have floating cities. And I'm kind of saying this to be cute, but only half cute. That's what could be in our future if this isn't addressed. San Francisco is a huge floating city area. Uh, Councillor Moffat. Um, I was going to say something else, but yeah, to that point, um, you're absolutely correct. And, and we found so many changes happening so quickly in our area. I mean, let's call a spade a spade. Um, that more and more people want access to land and water. And for a variety of reasons, the fact is that not everybody gets to have that access. And, you know, it's not our job to address that in particular, but it's our job to be attentive to and take action on the issues that can affect the overall lifestyle and economy of the community. And it's similar to the old saying of, you know, wow, I'd love to have a big Muskoka style boathouse with a big deck and a slide and this big dock, but I sure don't want my neighbor to have one. Right. And so it's that, that's that sort of common phrase is what's good for the goose has to be good for the gander. And um, as I said earlier around, you know, the work I did on the, um, the safety and well-being plan and detachment board, I like a project. So um, I would be willing to put in some work on this um, if uh, depending on what route council goes. Uh, my next question was, how do you propose that we move forward with this? And it, it looks like you provided us with at least partly part of an answer. I mean, I, I it sounds like Councillor Kennedy would be, uh, you know, willing to be involved, uh, as would I. I you know, I, I, I feel quite strongly about this issue as well. And uh, um, Councillor Moffat. Yeah, it needs it needs some zoning input for sure. Um, you know, we want to get the language right. Um, and I, the the deadline, I do have that tab open somewhere. The deadline is June. No, does anybody remember? Uh, April nineteenth. So there's not a lot of time. Um, but uh, anyway, I can. I don't know whether you want Mr. Rudder to take the lead on it or just pick up do something and let me know. What you'd like my role to be thoughts, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Please, somebody do it. <laughs> I, honestly, whatever council wishes. Um, it, it's not an area I have a great deal of expertise. I can tell you that. Not that I am an expert in anything, but uh, you know, I can certainly convene a meeting of the group you've described, and we can we can talk about how we advance that. That might be a good good approach. Uh, Councillor Moffat, then Councillor Roberts. Yeah, just thinking it would be need to be fairly quickly and and um, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that um, there doesn't need to be a group. I think there needs to be a small working group. Uh, but we also don't want to um, uh, bog ourselves down by trying to get nine people together. So I think the smaller the group, the possible we need to talk. Because of the specific questions that are being asked in the bulletin, the details are provided. Um, the answer is, I think, I think amongst the bunch, the bunch of us, we know our own situation. We just need some zoning input and to, and to make a statement of, yes, please make some rules on this and allow us the provision to enforce it. Would, to me, is the, is, the, is the ultimate outcome, but we can chat about that. Councillor Roberts. No, uh, thank you, Warden, and that's great, Councillor Moffat. That's sort of what I, no, I'm not part of it. Just the, the three of you have put your name forward to, to work on it. That's great. But really, at this point, because of the time, we do want to make sure that we get some kind of comment in because no comment ends up looking like either you don't care or, or you know. So we're trying to, I, I, think, I think the, the, the horse is kind of already a little bit out of the barn because we've seen uh, some situations where people have put a motor on a something and then it becomes called a vessel and uh, we just don't want it's a slippery slope and so I, I totally support uh, your meeting and um, trust that whatever comments you're going to make prior to the April 19th submission date uh, will be reflective of what what we're looking for we do want some kind of regulations on this. Councillor Moffat. Yeah and one of the things that that is a bit of a, a fly in the ointment is that um, you can buy because friends of ours purchased one. Uh, it's it's a dock, and it's a big dock, and and it's built by I can't put the name of the the dock company, and it's legitimate. And they just take out the pins, and the motor's already on it. And then because I've been on it, <laughs> we we can put around the lake on what is essentially a dock, 
but it is Transport Canada approved. So what's to stop someone from saying, hey, I'm going to put a tent on that, which is, you know, what they're saying. And then what's to stop somebody from saying, hey, it's like hip camp. Hey, I'll wrench in my floating dock with a tent on it for a weekend. And therein becomes a slippery slope of, of problem. So. Okay, so we look forward to, uh, to uh, a small, very small doodle poll. I hate to even say the words doodle poll. Mr. Rudder? I hate for you to say those words as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're, we're there. Um, next on the, on the agenda is the uh, a, a discussion about in-person council meetings. Uh, Councillor DeVolin. On or before April 21st? On or before April. Any specific reason for that particular date? Or you just, that's our next? Well, that's the legislation that all conditions are removed. I realize there's some practicalities in terms of staff setting up and whether we're going to continue live or Zoom. And I'll leave that to them. But uh, as of the 21st, all of the... Uh, all of the restrictions provincially are gone. So in my mind, there's no reason after that date to do anything but meet in person. Other thoughts? Uh, Councillor Roberts, then Raoul, then Moffat. Okay, thank you. Um, so while the restrictions may be lifted, we had Corey McKay at our Dicer Council meeting yesterday talk about our climate plan. And I think it's also gonna be really important on a go forward basis, well, we can meet in person without masks, sit on a room and, um, and you know, still stream through YouTube. So, so whether we have delegates, uh, we want to participate that way. I think it's something that we should be considering is how often do we want to meet in person? As a, just an example, the land division committee is an evening meeting. It worked really well a week ago, although be along, but how many people were out of Halliburton County that were able to sign in. Now, the members of the public do not get mileage, but four members of the Land Division Committee didn't charge mileage. So some things I think, I just want to say, just because we can meet doesn't mean we should be meeting for every single meeting. Um, I know the CAOs are talking about it. I know Dysart is thinking about their April meeting being in person, but maybe committee as a whole will stick to Zoom. I don't know. We're going to work on it, come up with a couple of suggestions. Or, or conversely, maybe committee of the whole is in person and county council is, uh, because there's more business, you know, that, that's being discussed at committee of the whole. Or, or, I mean, maybe I can see that there's lots of different options. And, and despite the regulations being dropped there, there were main sensitivities with people. If we've been wearing masks and, and meeting privately and uh, for a long time, and you know whether we like it or not, there are people that, that need a bit of time to adjust. Um, so you know, I, I think well, I'd look forward to hearing comments from other members of council on how they feel. Um, I'm sorry, I think Council Rayal was next, and then Moffat, then Shell. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I kind of disagree with, with uh, Councillor DeVol. And I know speaking personally, uh, not because it's legislated, because that part is just whoever decides to make the decision, they make it. Uh, it's related to the uptick that could be coming from what happened on Monday when we start doing what we're doing, the interaction. I know right now when I'm going into places, there's still a large percentage of people that are uh, wearing masks and, uh, and will continue to do so for a while. I am personally doing that. And I gotta be honest, uh, Council, that if we are going to be meeting in person in April, then I would take the Zoom option if it's available or I will not be able to attend. However, if, if what happens over the next month says that May works out good, then I, I, I probably think May would probably be a better month. Councillor Moffat. Um, yeah, so I, I agree <clears throat> with Councillor Roberts' idea of taking a hard look at what committees um, are can remain efficient and still be on Zoom. And I, I think, you know, in the beginning when Zoom started and we were all getting used to it, I think our heads were on fire because we we're thinking, oh, it's so unusual. And we're, we're looking at ourselves on a, on a screen all the time. We're so used to it now. And I think it's becoming part of the way we do business. Uh, I, I agree that there are some 
value in having some members of council or members of committees as, be able to zoom in. Um, kind of split the difference though on council meetings because I think our procedural bylaw, we agreed that you could zoom in if there were extraordinary circumstances. Uh, but I also think by the, that by the end of the next term, people will, things will be changed and you'll be able to zoom in from your house in Florida all winter. Like I think, I think that's just where it's probably going to go, even though I personally don't support that. Um, and so what do we do then if, if, if Councilor Ryle says I'm wearing a mask or I'm not coming, or what if a staff member says I'm not comfortable and like, so what are the, what are the complications or do we just say the regulations are all lifted? I think it's the 27th, but whatever the date is and, and that's how it is, you know, the end. So I think it's, there's still a little, little bit of exploration to be done. I, you know, I, I definitely agree with the, uh, with the, with the committee structures and, you know, uh, uh, the land division was a good example that uh, uh, particularly when the committees are meeting at nighttime, uh, you know, when you get into the, the winter season and the, uh, the challenges of, uh, of driving at night, um, it, you know, in, in bad weather um, and the mileage uh, becomes an issue as well. I can see that, that, you know, that there were some committees that could, uh, I know that the library board also meets, you know, late in the afternoon, which is not an issue in much of the year, but in the winter time, it, it could become an issue. But that's the library board's decision. Uh, I, I personally have a little bit of an issue with uh, a blended solution. Some meeting virtually, some not meeting virtually, but uh, that, that's just my own, uh, my own thoughts. We'll go to Councillor Shell and then Councillor Burton. Um, yeah, it's kind of tricky because some people are more comfortable with things than others, but it was kind of like the kids going back to school this, this past week, you know, the province said you do not have to wear a mask. So therefore there are several children at school wearing masks and probably a few kids who still do. If Councillor Ryle wants to wear a mask or socially distance himself at the meeting, I wouldn't take offense to it. I would have no problem with it. I would have a problem with somebody zooming in unless they had a broken leg or you know, a, a really good legitimate reason. But with the province lifting everything on the 27th, I think that we should be doing the same with the exception of some of the committees like you had just spoken um, regarding the library, for example, or the land division. But when it comes to council meetings, I think it's time that we get back together and we um, keep moving forward and, and setting an example, I think, for, for the community. Thank you. Councillor Burton. Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, we are going to have a report coming to our council uh, in April. Um, I, I believe part of that report will be uh, council meetings will be in person. Our optional meeting uh, will probably be via Zoom. Um, our committee meetings will be all by Zoom. Probably, I will say, for possibly six months. Our um, staff reports coming to our council meetings will be via Zoom. And so the only people that, uh, oh, and delegations will be done by Zoom as well. And uh, we may try to have a concession there for if, if someone cannot come in by Zoom for whatever reason, have a good reason that we can make arrangements for them to come in person. But that's where we're sitting, I believe, with the report right now. So I would think our first uh, meeting in May would be the date that we are picking to, uh, to meet in person. Okay, um, Councillor Al. Yeah, I think that I, I don't want people to think that I don't want to meet in person. And that's, not, that's not what I said at all. What I said was, I don't want to meet in April. Uh, I think May we'll, we'll have a better understanding. And if if the decision is that we meet uh, for all of our, our meetings, then that's great. If we meet for certain ones based on, on, on economics, on, on, on logistics and all the good things, that would be also okay. But I'm not against meeting in person. I'm merely saying that jumping the gun in my mind is not the right thing to do. First off, if it's not coming off until the 27th, then it seems to me the most logical would be made uh, to me. So if, if the decision is that we want to try it May, then, then I'm okay with that. I, I just don't want to do it in April. Councillor Moffat. Yeah, just to follow on Councillor uh, Burton's comments, Algonquin Highlands, 
uh, has decided it will meet in person going forward. Its first in-person meeting will be the 8th. We are also having staff. So we have a very small council chambers and so staff will be zooming in. They're going to be in the building because staff are in the building. Um, and I think it's just it's more an efficiency thing and a comfort level. And I, I think over time, um, uh, you know, it will it will evolve. But that's certainly what Algonquin Highlands is doing is uh, April 7th. We'll be in person with staff zooming in for their reports uh, just just to keep too many people out of the council chamber at the beginning. Council Burton. I've, I, I think I forgot to mention that our optional meeting, our second meeting will be via Zoom, just where our council meeting, that, our, our first council meeting that will be um, in person and the other, other one will be in Zoom. Um, when you say optional meeting, are you talking about committee of the whole or, or just whether you've got sufficient business to have a second meeting in a month? If we have sufficient business to have a second meeting. Uh, Councillor Kennedy, we have not heard uh, thoughts from you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have any issue with going back uh, to meeting in person um, uh, by the end of April. I think we've discussed that a little bit yesterday as to what we might be looking at. Uh, uh, I start, it, uh, it wouldn't be any sooner than that, I don't believe. And I, I do like the idea of being able to have committees Zoom, continue their Zoom meetings where appropriate and uh, social distancing. And if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. But I would, I'd like to see it move forward end of April, but uh, I'll go along with whatever county decides, it's fine. Well, if the, um, go ahead, Councillor Moffat and Councillor Shaw. Yeah, just to add, circle back on the whole, on uh, the whole mileage issue too. I, you know, we're looking, we're looking at uh, tenders that are coming in way over price. We know costs are increasing. Um, uh, and I think that it's important for us to have regard for that. We've just raised the mileage fee. Let's not all get all giddy and jump in our cars. So what makes the most sense um, to have an eye on saving a little bit of money? It's not much, but it's a little bit. And I think it's more of a philosophical commitment to reduce costs. Um, to me, that's more important than the in-person part. It's the let's do the best we can for not putting more cars in the road and, and, uh, uh, an increase in the mileage costs. Councillor Shell, then Councillor Devola. Um, I, I was just going to suggest then, considering that the 27th of April, when the province is opening up, is actually the day of our um, our council meeting for county council. You know, for the sake of the comfort level of Councillor Ryle and possibly others at the table, why don't we just say that we're going to um, come back into person for committee of the whole on May 11th? And uh, like I said, as far as the, I still stand by the idea of the committees being done via Zoom when possible, if necessary. Councillor Devon. Yeah, my initial comment was regarding county council, not committees. And obviously for our snowbirds and a whole bunch of other things in, in evening meetings to be able to continue a, a good chunk of them through Zoom, I have no uh, problem with that. But my my comments were specifically uh, regarding council. The reality is that if May is a doable date that everybody's happy, y'all live by that. Okay, so I'm I'm hearing that everyone would be uh, comfortable with meeting in person in uh, May for our committee of the whole meeting on the 11th. Um, I think uh, I'm also hearing that we're in agreement that uh, that meetings that are after hours or like not daytime meetings or could lead into the evening that they'll continue via Zoom. Um, because we've got committee of the whole, we don't have a lot of committee meetings, but we do have, we do have some, um, particularly land. Um, the library board has already, will have their own discussion about how they're going to meet. Um, does that sound reasonable? Mr. Rudder and then Mr. Bruton. I guess I just was looking for some further direction uh, with respect to members of the public and and staff. So what I think I heard is that staff would be um, not necessarily in the council chambers. They would be at their desks presenting their reports basically to, in a hybrid format and that the public would be able to watch online and to be able to access that way, but not be permitted in the council chambers. Is that correct? That's what I'm hearing, and that's what I think we're proposing for now. Um, Councillor Burton, and then Councillor Moffat. 
And that was my question as well. I, I guess my question was more uh, towards delegations. If we do have delegations, are we going to bring them in by Zoom or, or are we going to bring them in in person? I'm, I'm hearing bring them by uh, via Zoom for now. I, I guess that's what Mike had meant when he said public. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm uh, fine with that. Councillor Moffat, I think, and then DeVolan, uh, Councillor DeVolan, sorry. Uh, the the only exception would we include our CAO clerk in the room with us as council? I'm seeing yes, yes. What if I don't want to attend? I'm just. <laughs> I don't think I should say what I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, we would we would much prefer to have you with us if you uh, if you would be uh, willing. We miss you, Mike. Uh, <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think you have your direction there. Anything outstanding, Councillor Roberts? So just to be clear on a go forward basis, the, the county starting May 11th, I think is what we agreed on for committee yeah. to hold and council meetings will also then be in person. Okay. Yes. Uh, Councillor Moffat. Um, I think uh, Councillor Shell forgot to put in her order for cinnamon buns. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> please. They're, they're from that kitchen. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Burton. Uh, thank you, Warren. Just uh, um, should we, and I'd probably be up to Mike to think about this one, but should we have IT in the room with us, Mike? Is that needed or required or not? That is required. And I, yeah, they will be here, but um, physically distanced. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think we've covered that thoroughly. Thank you everyone for, uh, for your thoughts on that. Uh, I don't believe that we have anything for closed session today. Um, so we will move into the bylaw section. Could I have a mover and a seconder for bylaw um, to authorize an agreement with Miller Paving for service treatment? Councillors Moffat and Kennedy. Moved by Councillor Moffat, seconded by Councillor Kennedy, be it resolved that bylaw 4100 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Miller Paving Limited for surface treatment on various sections of county roads be considered to be read a first, second, third time, finally passed, and the seal of the corporation be affixed. All in favor? That's carried. Uh, next is a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Fowler Construction. Uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Shell. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Shell. Be it resolved that bylaw 4101 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Fowler Construction Company Limited for the rehabilitation of approximately eight kilometers of county roads be considered to be read a first, second, third time, finally passed, and the seal of the corporation be affixed. All in favor? That's carried. Next is a bylaw to authorize an agreement with uh, Young's Construction or Culverts. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Councillors Moffat and Kennedy. Moved by Councillor Moffat, seconded by Councillor Kennedy, be it resolved that bylaw 4102 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Young's Construction Limited for the removal and installation of culverts under County Road 16, be considered to be read a first, second, third time, finally passed and the seal of corporation be affixed. All in favor. That's carried. Uh, next is a, uh, an agreement for the uh, re rehabilitation of the Drag River Bridge. Mover and a seconder, please. Councillors Roberts and Shell. Uh, moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Shell. Be it resolved that bylaw 4103 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with Urban Link Civil Limited for the rehabilitation of the Drag River Bridge be considered to be read a first, second, third time, finally passed, and the seal of the corporation be affixed. All in favor? Carried. And finally, the uh, agreement for uh, for rehabilitation of the Dark Lake and New York River Ridges. Could I have a mover and a seconder? Councillors Burton and Moffat. 
Moved by Councillor Burton, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that bylaw 4104 being a bylaw to authorize the execution of an agreement with McPherson Andrews Contract Limited for the rehabilitation of the Dark Lake and York River Bridges be considered to be read a first, second, third time, finally passed, and the seal of the corporation be affixed. All in favor? It's carried. Are there any notice of motions? Hearing none, could I have a mover and a seconder uh, for the confirming bylaw? Councillor Shell and Burton. Moved by Councillor Shell, seconded by Councillor Burton. Be it resolved that bylaw 4105 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings at the March 23rd, 2022 meeting of Halliburton County Council be considered to be read at first, second, third time, finally passed, and the seal of the corporation be affixed. All in favor? That's carried. And finally, move in a second or two adjourn. Councillor Kennedy, Councillor Burton, thank you. Moved by Councillor Kennedy, seconded by Councillor Burton. Be it resolved that the March 23rd, 2022 meeting of Halliburton County Council be adjourned. All in favor. That's carried. See you all at one o'clock. Take care.